L G B L G B L G B L G B They say L G B everywhere I go L G B what it means I don't know L G B whatever it is L G B come on help me please please all righty then thank you <laughs> G-B. That let's go, Brandon. Right? L G B. This means let's go, Brandon. No. L G B. Sounds like let's go, Brandon. I guess. L G B. All right. Let's go, Brandon. I am Cornelio. Chant. L G B. Right wing and left wing. L G B. Go, oh, you know the thing. L G B. If you don't sing that back. G B and you play black. L G B. Let's go, Brandon. L G B. Let's go, Brandon. L G B. Let's go, Brandon. F J B. Let's go, Brandon. I'm Joe Biden, and I forgot this message. You are coping, coping and seeding. Just can't accept what you're seeing. Yes, you're coping, coping and seeing. The truth it is scalding, and now you are molding and coping. Coping so hard. Coping and seeing. And if you don't like my politics, don't buy my book. Don't read them. And if you don't like my politics, don't buy my book. Don't read them. Girls read comics. Girls have always read comics. Problem solved. White boys. Comic book reader. Don't buy my book. Don't buy my book. I, I literally can't even think. We can have a little conference on that. Um, would you please get your politics out of my comic books? Don't read them. What comic books are you reading? What comic books are you reading? Would you please get your politics out of my comic books? Don't read them. What comic books are you reading? What comic books are you reading? Comic book reader. Uh, comic book reader. Uh, and, uh, may I curse? White boys, don't read them. We're very worried about comics right now. Independent comic sales are down. Mainstream comic sales are down. Everything in the mid list is way down. You don't make a lot of money that way. There is nothing inherently masculine of heroism. There is nothing inherently masculine heroism. Girls read comics. Girls have always read comics. Problem solved. Magic. Going into the red on singles. They're not coming out until the trades. Stores are closing. You don't make a lot of money that way. So don't. Comics are booming. Holy cow, it's me. I'm here on Comic Artist Pro Secrets. It's me, your friend, Ethan Van Skyver, 30-year veteran of the comic book industry. I had some people going, what branch did you serve in? 
no, no, veteran of the comic book. That just means I've been working in comics. Where I didn't serve my country like uh, the great veterans who served in the military did. I would have, though. They wouldn't let me in because of my asthma. They gave me a Go Army shirt and said, go to hell. Uh, anyway, uh, world's most charming, disarming, elegant, eloquent, and yet humble, man. Great big Sopranos fan. Trust a member of the media, my friends. We've got quite a show for you today. Got a bunch of EFAPs to do. Are you guys uh, interested in EFAPing? Uh, are you guys interested in EFAPing some videos with me or no? Uh, that's right. Great meme war vet. I'm not that cringe, am I? I could be. A veteran of the war against mediocre artwork, says Mad Six Far. Yeah, especially right now. Cider Hype says, you didn't get a lollipop? I got nothing. I got nothing but that T-shirt. And wearing that shirt was insult. <laughs> it was like, it was so funny. Uh, all right, yeah, we're going to do some me faps. We're going to do a bunch of things. And also, as it turns out, am I just, what's going on? Why am I, am I like, Pausing every few seconds. What's up with my internet today? Uh, we'll have to figure out. Uh, hopefully it'll kind of. Uh... Teflon Ron says, I'm interested in when the links campaign starts. Um, yeah, I'm interested in that too. Give a little thought to links today. Uh, Clint Holinsky says the Didio uh, interview is very interesting. Well, we're going to look at that. We got a couple of Eric July videos to watch. Tons of uh, drama uh, going on with uh, the Ripaverse, the world of Ripaverse. Uh, Doug two hundred nine says you're looking very Scottish today. Oh, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, all right. So we're gonna do this. Uh, oh, what in the world is going on here? What a strange commentary. Josiah Haynes says, Ethan, my man, can you unprivate the Jonathan Hickman, Grant Morrison, X-Men interview EFAP? I wanted to watch it, but I missed it because I was at work. When was that? What, do you remember what the uh, video was called? I could go back and look for it and see. Uh, hotel story. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, our friend, uh, Narwhal, has launched Hotel Story today. Uh, his new Indiegogo campaign. So I just want to make you aware of that. Hotel Story, A Night of Smoke and Mirrors at Hotel Constantinople. Looks like he just launched just a few minutes ago. So uh, I want to recommend that you guys do what you always do when it comes to Narwhal projects. Go back it. You know, go over there and throw some support behind it. Make sure that uh, you've got your copy pre-ordered. Allow Narwhal to keep doing what he does. I mean, understand that's this is what Comic Skate is. Comic Skate is just uh, an opportunity for guys like Narwhal to to tell stories and make comics. I don't think he could do it otherwise. You know, not without agreeing to uh, certain, not without agreeing to certain precepts, left wing precepts and notions, and not without subscribing to a belief system, which I'm sure uh, Narwhal does not completely subscribe to. I think he does believe men can give birth, but, you know, not because of uh, any gender ideology reason. It's just one of these weird things that he thinks uh, might be the case. That's our narwhal. Hotel story on Indiegogo. <laughs> Go over there and back it. Support support our pal. He's such a great guy. Um, let me see. Play the trailer, says Norin Rad 2 Turbo. Okay. Uh, let's go. Let's play the uh, trailer. I played it before, but I'll play it again. Let's take a look at it. Synthesize. You must be hamming it up for a big chip. Sin the size. Three simple syllables. They may not mean much to you now, but by the end of this night, they will. There's a witch in this hotel. My mission is to stop her. Could mean certain doom for many if she completes her spell. We're bringing that knowledge back with us to the real world, but we're giving it a special touch. Don't suppose I know you. Adrian. 
You're a famous party pooper. At your service. Wow. That was great. Very exciting. Um, all right. So uh, Narwhal's Hotel Story. This guy can. Um, this guy knows what he's doing. He knows how to animate. He knows how to tell stories. And he's just a, an all-around swell guy. All right, now hold on a second. Josiah Haynes says uh, it was called E-Fapping Marvel X-Men Retrospective 2000s. Wow, did I have a classy title like that on one of my uh, live streams? Let me take a look here. Since you E-Fapped, or since you uh, have uh, super chatted me, I guess I have no choice but to uh, release that, re-release that uh, to the masses. Um, oh, here it is. Uh, oh, it's partially blocked. I'll make it public, but, oh, it, hold on. I'll make it public, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna, it's gonna reach you. Okay. Um, but it is, uh, um, let me see. It is public now. So hopefully you can see it. Let me know. Let me know that you got it. Uh, let me see. Caution Time says, I think you're on Eric's detractor list uh, per Nick's stream. Uh, you haven't defended him hard enough. Well, I mean, I'm unaware of uh, detractors list uh, that uh, Eric July has. I did see that. I wondered if he referred to me. Um, but I guess everybody probably wondered if uh, they were ref being referred to. Or is it just me? Is ever do I think everything's about me? Is this my narcissism? Uh, I don't know. I'm not here to defend uh, other creators. I'm just not. You know, uh, we we disagree about certain things, uh, and that is just the way it is. If I if I disagree with someone, I'm not going to defend something that I disagree with. Uh, but I'll defend Eric July in uh, every other way, you know. But a detractors list is fucking gay. And, uh, you know, the word detractor is kind of fucking gay, too. So, uh, Bobby Greer uh, says, nobody does it better than EVS. Yes, my friend. All right. So, here we have detractors. I have detractors. I have people who are detracting from me. Uh, don't we all? That's just the way it is. Life is all about having uh, supporters and detractors, I guess. And there's not much you can do about it. Uh, all right, now we've got uh, this beautiful uh, hotel story, Indiegogo, from uh, our friend Narwhal. But aside from that, I do want to point out that right now we are <clears throat> we are doing uh, we are shipping action figures. That's what I'm doing. I'm shipping action figures. I'm going to the warehouse uh, and I'm shipping out action figures to everyone. Uh, and, uh, if you would like some action figures, you're seeing people get them. People are glowing when they receive, uh, when they receive action figures, they're, they're so happy about it. You can get yours. And by the way, if you back today, you'll get them pretty soon. We want to have all of these, uh, action figure campaigns completely fulfilled for Halloween in time for Halloween. So if you'd like your action figures before Halloween, uh, back it right now. Back the Electric Blue Cyber Frog variant action figure campaign. All of the action figures are on this campaign. Every single variant. Take your pick. It's there. Uh, and you can uh, get yours. Uh, also, Cyber Frog 3, Red Extermination. Also, live on Indiegogo. Don't miss this. God damn, cyber frog. Excuse my language. Cyber frog absolutely rules. Working on uh, a bunch of great stuff coming up. 
People are asking about links. Uh, did do a little bit of thinking about links today. Uh, also, uh, I have uh, spoken about a new book, which is going to be, it's tentatively titled. And a lot of people are mad about this. They were just like, why would you uh, tentatively call it this? It's tentatively titled Young Heather Swain. Uh, and it talks about Heather Swain. It talks about, it's like a, <clears throat> what is it about? Uh, it is the, the time period 1993 uh, to 1996, Heather Swain, uh, 13 years old to 16 years old. Uh, her time in high school with um, uh, Anne O'Malley, who grows up to become dystopia. Uh, we learn about Deathfly, Ben Riley. We're going to do all of that. We're going to solidify that. We're going to tell that story, make it clear what it is. All in the time period when um, there was paranoia in Cyber Frog Land. This is before Cyberfrog even comes. Cyberfrog doesn't come until 1996. Uh, about aliens and uh, you know alien invasion, people uh, are well. People are expecting an alien invasion. People are thinking it's going to happen, uh, and it does happen in 1994. Uh, kind of a precursor, as you guys should know from reading Salamandroid Death Sting. All of this uh, is going to be seen from Heather Swain's perspective. Uh, from a young dystopia's perspective, and we are going to have an awful lot of fun uh, with this storytelling. I have another artist, one of the best artists. I had an SJW uh, just last week sit there and tell me, he goes, you know what, your Green Lantern was okay, but you know what, I like this Green Lantern artist better than you. I said, is that right? Yeah, he was so much better than you, this other Green Lantern artist. I said, that's interesting because he's working for me now. That guy works for me and he is going to be drawing this young Heather Swain book. So go F yourself. Uh, Clint, <laughs> Clint Holinsky, Maidens of Mayhem is live on Indiegogo. If you like Crotch Rocket uh, and the Tromboner, wait till you see the new character Super Tits. Oh, Clint. Oh, dear. <laughs> Caution Time says, agreed. You don't know nobody but your customers. Well, I want to, you know, listen, I, I do owe, uh, I owe my customers, but, you know, I owe my friends. I, I want to stand up for people uh, when they're being bullied. Josiah Haynes says, it's working. Thanks, mate. Okay, good. Yeah, you got it. No problem. Yeah, if there's a live stream, I, I had to take down a bunch of live streams to get my subscriber count working again. YouTube is a fucking scam. Uh, it, it basically, um, and I know it is because... If you behave certain ways, it rewards you. If you do live streams, your subscriber account just slowly decreases. When you um, uh, only do recorded videos, your subscriber count increases. And by the way, um, when you delete a bunch of live streams, suddenly you get, boom, a bunch of subscribers. It is There's no way that's real. I don't believe any of this. You call me paranoid if you want to. I don't believe any of this. I don't believe any of it's real. I just think it's all fake and gay because I know when I do certain things, I'm going to get this kind of uh, response from, from YouTube. It doesn't matter about the quality uh, so much of uh, the content that I produce. I just know that if I delete a bunch of live streams, boom, suddenly the next day I have 150 new subscribers. How did that happen? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, Mr. Uh, One Ball Whale says, Hey, LCG, I want my Rec Planet box. Love my toys. Well, you got your toys. Uh, where's your Rec Planet box? Didn't come yet. Hmm, I know those boys are working on it. Uh, let me see. Antoine Haynes says, Eric doesn't have a list. It's a rumor made by SJW. Okay. Well, that's good news. Don't want to be on any lists, guys. i seen Schindler's list. Oh, I do want to be on that. If I would want to be on Schindler's list. Uh, but yeah, lists are just, you know, not a thing to be on unless it's a guest list uh, to a party. Uh, Caution Time says, I'd like to think there's no list, but there, why, are we're going to talk about Eric July, are we? OK, uh, I'd like to think there's no list. But the reality is that Eric goes scorched earth with every criticism he receives. So it's not hard to believe. I don't wish him ill, but he's unwatchable now. Uh, well, there you go. Uh, I hope there's no list. No, Schindler's List was a good thing. Schindler's List meant, yeah, that you get to survive uh, the Holocaust because you get to make pots and pans. You know, if you make pots and pans, you can survive uh, being killed because, you know, you're good at something. And I think that's the way it was. Uh, 
caffeinated wolf says that's a patently untrue claim caffeinated wolf of course works for eric july all right since we're talking about eric july there are a couple of eric july videos that i wanted to watch uh, one of them is uh brand new uh and uh, the other one was from uh just i think yesterday a lot of crazy stuff is going on here uh neon knight rider says gleason rice or monkey have you announced it's none of them it's none of them holy cow i'd love I, I don't think Ivan Rice would ever be available, but Pat Gleason, I'd love to work with. Doug Monkey, I'd love to work with. I don't, I don't know uh, what their rates are. Uh, no, I have not announced. I have not announced this individual. You could probably easily find out by just maybe looking looking at my uh, Twitter. Um, but uh, And going back, look a couple weeks, I guess. <sighs> Yeah, I love all those guys. Green Lantern attracted some really, really good artists. Um, some terrible ones, too. We're going to talk about one of the bad ones tonight. Uh, but uh, I know Doug Monkey did some work with um, Phil, Phil Diaz. And I think Pat Gleason is really, like, nailed down to Marvel Comics. Like, he's got an exclusive, and I think he's working on Spider-Man books. And I couldn't get Pat, even though Pat and I are friends and we're still very friendly. Uh, I doubt I could get him to do something for me. He would do a great cyber frog. Oh, my God. Uh, all right, here we go. Let me see. Uh, 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 Carlos Pacheco. Oh, Carlos Pacheco passed away. <laughs> that's, that's not something that's funny, but uh, Carlos Pacheco uh, did pass away. So it's not him. Uh, all right. Let me see. Mr. Dongs is here. Bad news, guys. Rip a band me on site from his chat. Are you serious? That's weird. All right. Uh, I'm now I'm looking at the chat. Let me let me see what you guys are saying. Uh, e, did you enjoy old Dave Gibbons' work on Green Lantern? Yeah, I did. I love that. I referenced it quite a bit for uh, Green Lantern Rebirth. Uh, I, I took his, um, Carol, uh, and, uh, made his, like Dave Gibbons version of Carol was my version of Carol for rebirth. Uh, Carol Ferris, Hal Jordan's girlfriend, you know, uh, and then I also referenced it for Ferris, uh, aircraft as much as I could. I couldn't find, uh, you know, I, I wasn't a Green Lantern fan, so I went out and I bought just a smattering of comic books. And of Green Lantern comics to sort of get the feel of different eras of Green Lantern. Uh, and I, I was mostly attracted to Joe Staten uh, and um, and Dave Gibbons' time period in the early 1980s, which I thought was really great. So, uh, yeah, I did like that. Um, oh, people are upset about Mr. Dongs. EVS, get Michael Ringo. I'm sorry. He, he passed away as well. Yeah. That was another weird thing uh, that happened recently. Uh, we had Scott Kurtz. Scott Kurtz was sitting there like, I guess he's seen um, some of my uh, artwork for Cyberfrog Dark Harvest. It's a an extreme close-up of Lily. Dark Harvest opens up with a close-up of Lily, obviously in midair. Like you see like her shoulders, you see her arms outstretched, and you see her face like in full-fledged panic, screaming. And her hair is big and curly, and it's everywhere. It's blowing in the wind. And uh, Scott Kurtz decided to, uh, without my knowing it, you know, these guys don't name you. Uh, they don't, they're, you know, they kind of, I don't know. I don't like the thing where you don't, like, name who you're talking about. If you want to talk about someone, go ahead and just, don't be a coward. Like, name and shame. Or name and then, I don't know, let them respond. But Scott Kurtz, like, put my artwork up to uh, some pencil artwork. He said, let me explain. You know, you can't draw every strand of hair. That just shows no knowledge of how to draw hair. And then he put these two pencil drawings up that were really lovely of a woman who had hair nothing like Lily. I mean, Lily's hair is a tangled uh, kind of a permanent. I, would, I don't even know. How, extremely curly hair. Uh, and it's kind of like, you know, all around it. It's not like she gets it styled or anything. I'm sure her mom goes at her with scissors every now and then, but you know, she's a survivalist and at the end of the world. 
uh, and her hair is what it is. But I love the way I draw Lily's hair, and I like looking at it. I know it's good. When I like to look at it, I know it's good. Uh, but he's like, look at this. Your hair should be drawn as ribbons. Uh, and he drew, and it was like Sue Storm or something like that. And it was this nice pencil drawing of a woman with pin straight blonde hair. And I was like, well, I was looking at it and I was like, that's Scott, like Scott Kurtz can draw. I was like, wow, that doesn't, that looks like Mike Waringo artwork. Lo and behold, it was Mike Waringo artwork. You know what, pussy? If you're going to criticize me and the way I draw and you want to teach me a thing or two about how to draw a thing or two, why don't you draw it yourself instead of pulling up artwork from Mike Waringo or some other artist who can't, who, by the way, liked my artwork and uh, can't sit there and, and speak up for himself. And I was just like, what the hell is this? Like, if you're going to, hey, Scott, like, if you're going to, this is apples and oranges. If you're going to show me how I did, how I rendered curly hair incorrectly, draw curly hair. And then somebody said, oh, that isn't Scott's artwork. That's Mike Waringo's artwork. I was like, I fucking thought so. I knew he couldn't draw. <laughs> Look at Kevin. Yeah, everybody's like, my, he knows that was part of the joke. You know, they're asking me. Daryl Banks was great. I love Daryl Banks. And he also a super cool guy. Very nice guy. All right, let me see. Uh, why aren't you moving live streams to a second channel? Uh -huh. I hear this. I don't know. Uh, Fearsome Bullet says, uh, EVS, any smoke on a fearsome artist? Boy, I, uh, you know, fearsome fearsome no i don't have uh, any no i don't have any thoughts about a fearsome artist right now uh kenneth lowe uh who is one of your boy zach's uh artists i think uh he's actively working with him on a bunch of like jawbreakers stuff he reached out and he did he's like look i can do horror i can do nightmarish horror kind of stuff like dreamscape horror the kind of thing that you really want and his artwork was really beautiful um but uh, I just, it wasn't quite right. It wasn't quite right for me. I, I don't know. And I just kind of went, that's great. But I, you know, I don't think you're the guy and like, he's really good, but I'll, I'll know it. Like when I, I'll, I'll go forward with fearsome when I just happen across an artist who is perfect for the gig. Absolutely perfect. Other than that, there's no real reason. Uh, it seems like I'm kind of naturally expanding out the world of cyber frog and the Cyberfrog universe, I'm not, you know, I'm not just, it's not deliberate, it's just happening, like, Lynx belongs there, like, Lynx is uh, not even related to Cyberfrog, she's more related to Scorpion and Salamandroid, and that whole wing of the a time period, like, after Cyberfrog had already been, uh, you know, quote-unquote killed, and then, you know, was in hibernation, uh, I, I wanted, I, I'm excited about doing a book from her perspective. And then also the next book being young Heather Swain uh, and just seeing, uh, being able to show um, a lot, like how Heather Swain became who she was, how Heather Swain became somebody who uh, was, who went from like, uh, um, man, she was a child prodigy a musician uh, to kind of a depressed, uh, you know, individual who uh, needed an escape from her life, you know, and and uh, that's going to be the a kind of uh, story that happens uh, in this uh, young Heather Swain thing. Uh, so uh, I'm very excited about it. I'm very excited about that. That's going to broaden out Cyberfrog's world, and then we've got the Salamandroid series as well. I'm more interested in that. I just think there's uh, the the world of Cyberfrog. It really does exist in my brain. Like I, I have a timeline. I, I, I know all of the characters. I understand why they're doing what they're doing and how they interrelate. And I, the quicker that I can tell that story, uh, in in the best way possible, like that's what I want to do. So uh, I can't do it all myself. I understand, but I'm going to write it all myself. Uh, and uh, I will hire artists, really, really good artists, to help me do uh, to do that to actually draw it. So. Uh, let me see. Blast. And so fearsome, like fearsome isn't even in cyber frogs universe. I don't think, you know, I don't, I don't, maybe it could be, but blast radio says, I liked the DDO interview, but John should have pressed him on his role in pushing SJW propaganda, starting with Batwoman leading into the new 52s. Also, 
The Dio bragged about pushing that character's sexuality in a 2006 interview. We'll, we'll talk. We'll, we'll watch that and we'll, we'll sort that out. I'm interested in what it is that he uh, has to say. Uh, all right, let me see here. A lot of people here talking about Ripa. People are interested in Eric July. I knew that you would be. I got those two videos up. We will look at them. We'll talk about them. Base Art Department says, Hail E, new to comics and started with CG. Bought Blood Honey from your eBay. And it got sent to a random address. I uh, reached out and it was immediately resent. Well, that's good. Love the book. In fact, more. There's a little bit of that going on right now. Andrea said, you know what? Like, so we got, I can't remember where it was. But we got we sent out a foreign order like to like Bolivia or something like some kind of more more obscure country like not one that we send a lot of packages to, and it got sent to Thailand instead. And I, like, what is going on with that? Because that doesn't seem like a mistake that would be too easy to make. Uh, yeah, uh, Asian O time. The time Atlas says, I just tagged you in the Scott Kurtz tweet. It doesn't matter because you blocked me. As soon as I uh, pointed it out, as soon as I said, hey, why don't you, uh, he like blocked me. He instantly blocked, uh, not me, of course, this, you know, the all caps comics official account, which of course, you know, that information gets relayed straight to me if it concerns me. Uh, Neon Knight Rider says, Jay Lee cover for new Miller book looks familiar, lol. Did he do the same kind of layout again? I've seen him do it a few times. It's just a familiar layout for him. That's funny. Yeah, I don't care. It's it's best on the Cyberfrog book. It is absolutely iconic. It really looks good. Uh, Andrew Westwater says, Rec Planet Executive Boxes, Christmas 2024, maybe. Second chance, want it all for Christmas 2025. Never ending story. <clears throat> Andrew, I uh, I got to tell you, I you know we're we're shipping them, uh, and they're all going out, and people are receiving them. You got to you got to know the the only reason like something like that would be delayed until twenty twenty four is if the stuff wasn't in yet. It's in, it's finished. The books are in. It's a matter of shipping, packing, and shipping, packing and shipping, and the honeycomb boxes. I think people who receive them understand. Uh, it takes a while. They, they really do take a, a little bit of time to uh, to prepare these packages. We ship them out as quickly as we can, uh, but they are uh, they are a project. I'm never signing ever again. That's one thing that I told the boys. I said, you know what the holdup here is me having to sign all this stuff every day. I got to sign five books for a single package to go out. Five books. And I, I did that to myself. I was just like, yeah, sure. I'm going to sign everything, all the all the books. Five books for a honeycomb box to go out. Uh, and uh, it's exhausting. It's like I sit there and they open boxes and they pour them out on the desk and I sign, sign, sign. And uh, it's, uh, it's it, I'm not doing it anymore. I'll sign specifically for when people ask me to. But just signing everything indiscriminately is um, a lot of work that I don't think people really care about. You know, it's like I I just don't think people really care, and I'm I'm it's a holdup. Base Art Department says I got blocked by Doug Tenapel because I asked why he takes pot shots at CG on X all the time. Even his colorist Catherine was agreeing with me. Yeah, the Doug Tenapel thing is really annoying because um you know um uh, you know Eric July talks about good faith all the time, and I really feel like I approach Doug Tenapel in good faith. And uh, he he dealt with me in bad faith. Uh, and it's very simple. Constantly, you know, um, in bad faith, he said, I need help. I was fired from a job. I need, a, you know, I, I need what Comicsgate can give me. I need a, you know, I need a leg up. I need to rebuild my career. I said, we can do that for you. Come on over here. Let me introduce you to Comicsgate, Doug. Uh, <laughs> create a new book. I'll help you out. Doug created a... a was it not Earthworm Jim, but uh, Bigfoot Bill, which was Earthworm Jim with a fur coat. He came over here. He was on the show all the time. We raised a lot of money for him, and he got to know how to crowdfund and, you know, what to do. And then when he was done, he, like, disavowed Comic Skate and said, I won't be using the hashtag anymore. So why not? He said, well, I got, look, I'm doing Earthworm Jim now. 
uh, Earthworm Jim considers Comicsgate to be controversial. And I said, how are we more controversial than you are? Like, you're all over the media saying that, you know, uh, saying a lot of, like, stuff about trans people and gay people, which, by the way, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying, uh, how are we more, you're, you're controversial. Like, your whole thing is controversial. Like, I don't understand, like, why we're more controversial than you are. I don't think we are. Uh, and that just uh, erupted into a big thing with his fans and uh, Doug kind of uh, saying that Comicsgate is this and that. And it really sucked, man. And I was just like, I, I don't think I like Doug to Naple. Uh, Christine Venner says, waiting for, waiting for bated breath, waiting with bated breath for my books. Well, with some breath at any rate. What the hell? We got to get these books out as quick as possible. Uh, yeah, just lowering the value of all the SIGs. Well, I mean, look, I'm doing it this time. I, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not going to do it again because I just, yeah, I just don't think it's a, it's a holdup. Fortunately, like the second chance campaign is almost completely unsigned. Like everything in the second chance campaign is like unsigned unless somebody paid for it. And um, I don't know how many um, people paid, but not too many. So those packages should go out really, really quick. We just want to get the first one done first. Caffeinated Wolf says, Doug used the CG platform, then ditched it as soon as he uh, didn't think he needed it anymore. Yeah, it was bad faith. And then he, he like, set me on fire on the way out and, he, you know, called me anti-Christian. And, God, it sucked, man. I, I just, <clears throat> I really just, uh, I learned, I learned to be very skeptical of people on the Internet. I used to just invite everybody in here and. There are a lot of people saying, you know, boy, I, I would love to get a chance to be on the show to promote my comic and stuff. I get messages like that all the time. And I'm just in a way like part of me is kind of like bug off. <clears throat> and I go, that's Doug to Naple. You know, that's the influence of Doug to Naple. <clears throat> uh, all right. So here we go. Uh, let's uh, take a look. What are we doing first? Are we doing uh, uh, Dan Didio or are we doing uh, Eric July? Let me see the chat. <clears throat> wow. Hmm. Distrust and verify everything, says John Porton. Yeah, more or less. Um, yeah, always be skeptical of people who want to. Well, <clears throat> right, hold on a second. It looks like most people are saying Dan DiDio. Okay, so we're going to do Dan DiDio first. There we go, which is promised. That's what the, uh, the stream is called. <clears throat> Here we go. I'm excited about this. This was a big get for uh, John Delarose. <laughs> By the way, uh, everyone go subscribe to John Delarose. What's going on, everybody? <laughs> I hope you're having a great Tuesday. Is Tuesday new comic book day now? No. I I sometimes get new comic books on Tuesdays. Um, it Like with the Penguin distribution thing that's happening now. Like they don't always come on Wednesdays. And then, you know, there's some nice people who give them to me. So a lot of people are saying, why did Dan DiDio do the show? <clears throat> because Dan is not political. Hmm. Hmm. So that's why he doesn't know who John is. He doesn't care. So I don't. I, maybe are they supposed to hold them to Wednesdays? Is that how? How does this work, Industry Insider? <laughs> well, uh, the the inside, from what I hear now, this is just rumor. Actually, no. Uh, the uh, the DC folks uh, signed up with a company called Luna, uh, and their distribution okay. is Tuesday. The reason why they switched to Tuesday is they wanted to align the release of the comics to the release in the bookstores at the same time. Uh, traditionally. Um, comics are released on a Wednesday and they have the full selling week until hmm. the following Tuesday if they have a collection to sell prior to landing in the bookstore. So they always had a slight advantage over the bookstore market. Um, and I think the DC folks wanted to level the playing field, so to speak. Well, that makes a lot of sense seeing as uh, things are a little shaky, uh, just like with the amount of uh, comic shops hmm. there are out there and things like that these days. You want to expand all the distribution as much as you possibly can. And this is somebody who's doing so for Frank Miller, everybody. Uh, and uh, so I'm sure you've never heard of him before. His name's Dan Tadio. 
uh, <laughs> and he writes comic books. So, yeah. yes. Right. Yeah, actually, it, it, we were talking about this before. I said, you know, I, it, the interesting thing for me was that um, I was actually doing some writing prior to joining DC. You know, I've always, I've been executive for a while. I mean, I was an executive at um, ABC and then with an animation company called Mainframe. Uh, but that's where, by the way, a little trivia there. That's where I met Dan Didio originally. It was just an amazing coincidence. Cyberfrog has just kind of strung right through my entire like life. Uh, Dan Didio was working at Mainframe Animation, and I had to take a meeting with him because Mainframe Animation was uh, they were going to do the Cyberfrog TV show in the nineties. <clears throat> so I got to go over to uh, Mainframe and take a look at some Beast Wars stuff, take a look at a couple of like really quick sample. Uh, they're probably really embarrassing now, the CGI, but uh, a little bit of uh, Cyberfrog animation. And, and Dan was there. So Dan knew who I was when he went to D.C. He knew about Cyberfrog. And, uh, you know, he was going to be the guy. So it was just weird. When he went over, when he was the new guy at D.C., it was I couldn't believe it. I just thought it was the strangest thing because it was like these two worlds were kind of converging for me. Uh, pretty neat. Well, joining me for him, I was doing animation writing. I did a couple of series, television series. Um, and they made reboot DC, and beast wars I, I came yeah. in, the, in the editorial department but even prior to being at dc while i was hmm. interviewing i was actually co-writing superboy uh with jimmy pamiati uh, and the wow. two jobs had nothing to do each other we, we, we always laughed because jimmy had worked with joe casada then then joe went on to be the executive editor or editor-in-chief over marvel and then jimmy worked with me and i went on to be executive editor so he obviously he's the one who breeds executives <laughs> uh in the comic market jimmy is like uh jimmy Jimmy uh, Palmiotti is somebody who I always thought uh, kind of attached himself as an inker to the most promising up and coming artists. Uh, and then, you know, when he became a writer, obviously, he, he you know, he's working with Dan DiDio early on and Dan becomes the EIC and then the president of DC. I always wondered if Jimmy resented Joe Casada. Because uh, it wasn't just uh, Marvel Comics didn't just say, "Hey, we want Joe Casada." Marvel Comics said, uh, "We're going to do something called Marvel Knights with Jimmy and Joe." And uh, Marvel Knights in the late '90s <clears throat> was really cool. Uh, it was uh, Joe Casada doing Daredevil with uh, Kevin Smith, which to me was as good as. Some people might disagree. But Kevin Smith's uh, and, and Joe Quesada's Daredevil book was as good as McFarlane's Spider-Man. I just thought it was terrific, very exciting, visually exciting. Uh, I, I guess the only difference would be that, like, the writing was pretty good, too, because Kev, Kevin Smith wrote it. Uh, and uh, eventually, like, somebody at Marvel took Joe to lunch and just said, you know, we want to make you EIC of Marvel. and you know, um, well, what about Jimmy? Well, we don't want Jimmy. And it's just like, uh, Joe was like, okay, cool. So kind of busted up his partnership, long-term partnership, very successful partnership with Jimmy Palmiotti. And, and who was Jimmy Palmiotti? Well, Jimmy Palmiotti to me was always the, the personality. He could ink. He was a good inker. He's, he's a pretty good writer. He's an idea guy, but he was definitely the personality if there is somebody uh, who is in the mainstream right now who could successfully run a YouTube show the way I do, uh, it would be Jimmy Palmiotti. He is uh, a raconteur. He's a really, really cool, funny guy uh, who's extremely friendly. <coughs> <coughs> and you just want to kind of hang out with Jimmy. And I, I always liked what Jimmy said. Like, Jimmy was definitely in this for business. I just remember like Jimmy just being like, look, this is, you know, I'm here to get rich. I want to, I want to get rich on comic books. And I was like, what? Nobody is saying that. There's nobody saying I want to get rich at comics except for Jimmy Palmiotti. I really admired that. Well, Jimmy's got the Midas touch in a lot of ways. Yeah, uh, so absolutely. definitely. So cool, cool background there. Yeah. So uh, you, uh, you of course took over, uh, uh, DC on the on the editorial side in I think 2002. So and you ha you had that role for a long time, but it, I found it, out this what I was telling you ahead of time. Like I didn't know you wrote comics, and um and I I, I did pick up the first five issues of Ancient Enemies, which is actually what we're here to promote today. So you're like the, the so you're the guy issue. who bought them. I was trying to figure out who bought those comics. Yeah. 
So, and there's side stories, and I got to get into this because I've read it, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a full review as a review because I do review okay. videos too. Uh, once the sixth issue's out, because that that's kind of where you and should do it. And that's tomorrow. Actually, that's opinion. tomorrow. That's the fun um, part about this. Uh, that's gonna be fun. So that is coming out in college uh, perhaps tomorrow, guys. Look at the look uh, at the yeah, chats man. right now. Uh, uh, a lot. Uh, why is Tom King still not fired? Everyone hates him, and that Jay Lee incident was just like, oh, I want to hear him uh, answer that. Some of these are really good, man. Good for you guys showing up and at, uh, asking good questions to to digest here. And I'm sorry to cut you off about your uh, your your writing and how you you consider oh, yourself a writer first there. Yeah, that's okay. yeah. I'm used to people cutting <laughs> <laughs> I work in the comic business and work Oof. for retailers. Uh, <laughs> no, it's it was you know it's funny um, um because I had written beforehand and I and I do enjoy it. I, I I'm not a, a writer like most of these guys are. Face Paul Miotti? That's career, funny. Your I boy Zach is amazing. Thanks, Matt. Being part of the process and actually just getting your own ideas together. Um, and that's that's actually a lot of fun. Of, and, and the collaboration that comes along with it, working with an artist. And early on, I mean, I was at, when I started DC, I was actually started as a VP of editorial, which was this rather ambiguous job. Um, and then within the first year, uh, I was getting ready to leave. And then I was given the position as executive editor, which I held. Uh, for almost eight years, maybe a little bit more than that. And then after that, I moved into the co-publisher, publisher position. So hmm. all in all, close to 20 years with DC Comics. Um, and he was the only was guy who got things between the on. executive editor and publisher position, or was it more of like a title upgrade? Uh, no, no, it's a, there, 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 there actually is some very strong distinctions. I mean, when you're executive editor, you're involved in the nuts and bolts of the entire line creatively. So you're really helping direct the, and focus the individual books, very hands-on on the individual talent of being hired and such like that. And while I move into the public position, publishing position, first of all, you're much more concerned about the financial aspects of, of what's going on, the financial success. Mm. You're responsible for all areas, not just publishing uh, the editorial, but also production, sales and marketing and all the other things that fold into the overall company. And then on the other side, when you get involved in the creative, really when, I'm, when I was publisher, I was involved in the Preset, you know the uh, the, the setup, the uh, pre-production awesome. aspect of it. You know the approval up to the approval, then the, then the book disappears into the editorial. <laughs> There's scene. no controversy. The next time I see it, it really is the final. Product the controversy, it, the think. controversy is this. The only controversy is that Dan DiDio. It's nothing that he said or did, except that Dan DiDio deigned to appear on John Delarose's YouTube channel and submit to an interview by somebody who is clearly uh, on the right. John Delarose is a right winger, uh, and therefore, uh, this has upset a lot of people. A lot of people consider this to be, when I say people, SJWs aren't strictly people, but uh, it's upset a lot of these SJW comic pros who just uh, gatekeep uh, and want to uh, want to terrify uh, people into not associating with, dealing with, doing business with, collaborating with uh, right wing forces right-wing people folks uh in the uh, comic book business uh bambo says is dan going to regret this yeah probably you know i mean he already does probably regret it a little bit yeah and you have to make these decisions I, you know i think you know, I mean, it's an interesting know. thing when you you're involved in that early stage of production mm. and you have this idea and concept of what you think this book is going to be and then when it <laughs> lands on your Kevin. desk it, it might not be the same and it might be dramatically different and then you have to make a decision whether do we proceed in this fashion do we pull it back do we slow it down do we change it or do we just let it i'm go? going to speed up the um, interview a yeah, little and, bit and, and those are the decisions you pretty much make every all day all due respect that kind of happens uh, at every level though because like even even like when you're writing a script and you envision something and then you get it back from an artist uh and a lot of times it's like you might not even get the script back from an artist uh, until months later, and you don't even remember what you wrote at the time. And it looks good when you see the art on there, and then then you go back to like actually the dialogue again. You go, oh god, he didn't even draw it remotely what I thought. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that happens. And I mean, and that's yeah. part of the collaborative process, and that's what's good about you should have this rapport with your talent that you're always communicating in some way. Um, and you have to understand part of the process is the artist has to be entertained. He has to be interested and excited about what he's doing, or else it really does show dead on the page. You know, if they just follow something that they're not interested in drawing. So you have to give them that creative leeway to be able to bring their own sensibilities. And you have to understand it is a collaborative process. Um, the hardest thing is what you said, though, is, is omissions. When things aren't there that you thought were there, and you have them in your head, and you don't yes. realize they're missing until either at the very last second or even after it's been published. You say, oh, we left and that's, that's when you see a lot of oh, awkward dialogue wounds. Yeah, yeah. That didn't actually happen all the time. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's old school comic storytelling. I mean, you know, they used to, they used to be churning this out in such a speed that when the pages came in and the art yeah, was But clear, you know what, John Scott, Dan, 
and talking, you know, and, and he's, uh, he's, this is one of the best um, interviews I've seen so far, you, just in terms of fans engaged. Um, when you put too much description, he knows he's dealing with somebody who has a brain um, in his head. When the art really, you know, I love books that come in and fast the story okay. the art without any dialogue. I always view that as the best art out there. That's what makes it comic a lot of the time. Yeah. I do see the super chats, everybody. I'll run, I'll run Dan through the gauntlet of super chats after, uh, after uh, we go through, like, uh, what he's been up to. <laughs> I don't see that. anything. This is good. Engine, oh, engine, okay. engine enemies uh, sounds great and interesting. Yeah, uh, and we're going to get to that, too, for, for sure. Yeah. So I just yeah, got, yeah. I discovered you um, back in Comic-Con 2010, maybe. Ooh, um, okay. And uh, so that's what I, I was I was kind of just out of college. And, and, um, and actually, I decided to get into writing and making my own independent comics uh, because I was so mad at you and Joe Quesada. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, was, I feel uh, like we're saying, yeah. take a number, take a number. <laughs> yes, and it was, uh, and I didn't hate you in 2010 because you hadn't canceled my favorite book yet. Uh, I, I hated you after um, uh, with the new 52 launched. Uh, and so, so Joe I think he first, did defend me, and uh, that was with I'm not mad at Dan at all. You might have heard of that one causing a little bit of uh, friction out there. <laughs> yeah, uh, mine was a little less because I, I, I'm guaranteed like this didn't sell well enough, and so probably like 10 years down the line, where I'm looking at this, I'm like. I kind of get why he canceled this at the end of the day, but I was very into uh, Stephanie Brown Batgirl. That was my favorite book in DC Comics. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and then the new Fifty Two just going, wash that away. Uh, I was like, oh no, I, I was so upset because my favorite book was gone. But I, I'm, it, I'm sure there's financial decisions behind that. Yeah, you know, the other reason, I mean, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of it had to do with with the resetting to the most recognizable interpretations uh, of the characters. Fair. And you know what I mean. And that's that's always a problem. I mean, I, I had done a big push. For really a, a next generational drive. Yeah, but Dan probably really liked that. We never got DJ to where it was hoped it could be, like and we were never Dan able is. to do it completely. Um, and Hate you over happen, creative it wasn't decisions is good. We wanted to, to restart or something like that. It was actually because the sales were really soft. Overall, market didn't have a, a single book over. Dan is like somebody who uh, would would appreciate the fact that JDA said, "Look, I was angry with you because I was deeply engaged in the story." Dan Dan would say things like, uh, "An angry reader is an engaged reader." Uh, and so like, you know, that probably endeared <laughs> John saying that probably that endeared Dan to John, uh, or the other way around, uh, your friend bat says, Ethan, did you and Dan leave on good terms? I mean, I, I don't know. I, here's what I said to Dan, you know, I said, listen, I'm never going to say anything bad about you. I think you treated me really well. Uh, have I ever said anything bad about Dan Didio since then? I'll bet I have. Uh, you know, because time goes on and I talk every day in different, you know, on different days, I feel different ways about people and things. Um, but for the most part, uh, I, I respect them. Uh, I got to say that, uh, and for the most, when I say the most part, I mean, vast, the vast majority of the part, I respect them. There are only a few things about them that uh, I'm not happy with. Um, and uh, I'm sure that Dan's feeling about me is that I've made myself extremely controversial. Uh, and he understands the space. Uh, he understands uh, all of this stuff. He understands that people who he's associated with, uh, with I've directly insulted at this point, uh, that I've given away company secrets. These are all no-nos. These are all things that have uh, made me uh, not just toxic, but radioactive uh, to the, the comic book industry. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I would like to think that Dan understands why I'm doing what I'm doing, because we did have a really, really good talk right before uh, I was dismissed from uh, my contract. Um, but uh, who knows? I haven't talked to him, nor would I. People who are saying, uh, you know, bring him on the show. I, I don't I Dan would have to come to me and say, I want to be on your show. And why would he do that? The, I would never invite him. He was just on John Delarosa show. I would never invite the scrutiny and persecution that he would receive uh, by being on my show. I would never want that for him. I'd never ask him to do that because if I invited him on the show, I think he would have to politely find an excuse not to do it um, because he he knows what would happen to him. Uh, what's happened to him just on being on John Delarosa's show has been inexcusable. We'll look at the article about that in a second. Uh, and that that's true with everybody. I mean, Mark Miller, I'd love to have a nice talk with Mark Miller. We we talk in private, but a public kind of conversation. I would love to do that, but I, I don't, I, you know, it's like they have to come to me. I'm not going to go to them. Everybody who is in Comicsgate right now, Comicsgate Kings, are people who understood uh, what they were in for uh, and still got into this hot water anyway. So, you know, all of the comic skate kings, these are all professionals 
who took that big leap and, uh, you know, who are in trouble because of it, because they're, they've associated with me. I respect them. I will always promote them. I will always look after them. I will always be loyal and true to them uh, for that very reason. Um, you know, but I don't, I wouldn't say, uh, Hey, come hang out with me. I just don't think I would do that. Not in 2023. Uh, let me see. Well, hung and dunk says, I thought Ethan wasn't fired. Like Renfam has said, um, they go back and forth about my cancellation, depending on how they're trying to get me. Uh, the truth is they pressured DC comics, uh, in several different ways. There are a bunch of different ways that they did it. It was incredible. Cancel, cancel culture is, it's not, it doesn't just hit you in one way. It's not just saying, you know, um, uh, one thing or the next. It's not just getting you fired from your job. It's attacking you in 15 or 20 different directions for a bunch of different reasons, trying every single thing that they can do to dislodge you from every association, make it shameful to associate with you, uh, all of these things. And when it's happening to you, it's bewildering. Uh, what ended up happening was, uh, you know, all of my peers, these, these, uh, all of my peers, but Many of the writers at DC and Marvel, because of what I said about Hillary Clinton, this is according to Rich Johnson, I'll never know the complete truth because I was not in the Whisper Networks. Uh, what I said about Hillary Clinton, according to Rich, Rich Johnson, caused all the writers to get together and swear to never work with me again. Uh, they hit DC Comics with that bunch of news articles, a bunch of things like that, uh, all calling me a white supremacist. Uh, and uh, DC just not knowing how to deal with it at a time when they were trying to sell themselves to AT&T. Uh, and so DC said, we're going to not renew your contract. It's not the same as being fired because I never really worked for them. I was a contractor. I had a contract with them. Them saying we're not going to renew your contract is as good as them firing you. It wasn't my choice. But at the same time, they did say they did offer me things like ways to sort of submit. They said, cancel all of your social media, kill your Twitter, kill your YouTube. I said, I can't do that. I can't do those things. Uh, and I said, I actually did say at one point, I said, if I did that, would you renew my contract for another three years? Like if I were to get rid of Twitter and YouTube, would I be guaranteed work for the next three years? I'm sitting here trying to figure out what I'm going to do with Ava, you know? Uh, and I was told, no, there's no guarantee of that. And I said, well, then what are we even talking about? I, you know, there's no, there's no guarantee. There's nothing in it for me. I, I'm not going to do it <clears throat> because I need my social media to defend myself against what's happening to me. And they understood that nobody was being, uh, you know, completely out of line. And, uh, so that's what it was. I mean, it was just kind of, uh, you know, at the same time people were saying, uh, oh, he's associating with Richard C. Meyer. I was called into the office about that. Uh, it was all political. It was all incredible cancel culture. I saw like, uh, you know, them discussing me. Jamal Eigel's Facebook still has a post from 2017 where they're like, we got a real Ethan Van Skyver in. And the responses from my fellow comic pros are incredible. It's an incredible thing to read. I, I couldn't have I, I couldn't bear reading something like that when it was happening, but reading it now from this perspective, it's just a shocking, uh, a shocking thing to to witness, to to read. Uh, them just being like, yeah, you know, the conservative Christian sitting there talking down socialism, bizarre, absolutely bizarre. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's what it was. I, I was, uh, you know, not fired, but. And then at the same time, like I quit early, they gave me like a bunch of books to do to finish out my contract. I quit one issue early. I walked away. I said, I can't be here anymore. It's really uncomfortable. I got I to gotta leave. I can't finish out my obligations here. So um, it was complicated, but sucked, man. It was awful. Evil One says, could you get Jimmy on the show with Billy? Jimmy and me instantly hit it off when we met because we had tons of mutual friends. Amanda is cooler than Jimmy. Uh, yeah, for the same reasons, like I wouldn't even do it. Like they would have to, uh, they'd have to come to me. Tree Goblin says, uh, if Dan had a Tommy gun, would he use it on you or the diversity hires? That's a good question. He would, I don't know. I don't think Dan would use a Tommy gun on anyone. Maybe he'd use it on the diversity hires. Maybe if he had to use it on somebody, 
if he had to. Imagine a scenario where in order to save the world, okay, Dan had to use his Tommy gun on either me or the feminists that forced him at, you know, uh, at that convention in 2010 to hire a bunch of untalented women. He might use it on them. I'm not saying he would, but he might if he had to save the world. What did I do for him except for uh, rebirth and uh, all those other things? Uh, Jose M says, I want you to disavow uh, your boy Zach and Cecil voice. I can't do Cecil's voice, and I would not. I'm not disavowing you, boy Zach. Ever. I just kind of walked away from you, boy Zach. I, we're going in. I said to him, "We're going in two different directions, aren't we?" And he said, "Yeah." I said, "All right." He's like, he's he's going that way towards gardening and sort of saying the culture war isn't real and you know whatever it is. And obviously, I'm you know pedal to the metal in the opposite direction. Uh, Agent Cub says, "You and Dan are still Facebook friends." Oh, I didn't know that. Well, that's nice. I don't think he knows it either. <laughs> and we'll just leave it that way. Uh, all right. Are we good? Here we go. Uh, wow. All right. <clears throat> People are talking about Nick Ricada. Uh, would Didio use a Tommy gun on Ray Fisher? I Those two worlds don't really connect. I don't think Dan has any opinion about Ray Fisher uh, professionally. Over 60,000 copies. Wow. Uh, it was extraordinarily depressed. They, if I remember correctly, the business had dropped from year to date from the primary previous year almost by uh, 15% overall. So we knew we had to do something drastic. Jim and I were just in a brand new job. We had brand new bosses. Um, and we didn't want to be bringing the doing the slow grind down to the industry, just starting in a new position. So we wanted to do something dramatic, and we did. Um, and, and the thought was to get back to all the characters, the, the original interpretations. Um, you know, Stephanie Brown's a really interesting character to me because that was a really good book, and we had some great stories planned for her that never came hmm. together. Um, and, you know, you know, you, you, they, there's always this, this, this bevy of missed opportunities. Uh, but I always say the books that always are the best ones are the ones that we never made because they always keep their potential. And, uh, <laughs> and Why am and, I uh, being talked about in the chat here? Look at this. Cowardly EVS running away and buggering off. EVS running is a funny image. Lol. EVS has always spoken highly of Dan. Where is EVS? I think I was at a baseball game. Um, I remember this happening. I was not home for it. So uh, I, I didn't get to watch it. In fact, I have not watched it yet. This is my first time seeing it. Uh, they, they never get a chance to, to become fully realized. But in, with Stephanie Brown, I had this, we had this wonderful story. Welcome, Vito. When, to get her into the job of back row where... Barbara Gordon gets the use of her legs back, but in a very flowers for Algernon sort of way, starts to slowly lose them. So she handpicks her replacement and trains her before she loses the use of the legs again. And that's when Stephanie Brown was really supposed to emerge. <laughs> oh, just, wow, that's cool. Yeah, it was really you, skipped you, skipped of, you skipped over. She's just kind of Batgirl without an origin so much at that point, as I recall. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so well, we had this we had <laughs> story all built, and unfortunately, we were, I can we were run. allowed to do it. So I had no time to build a new origin, so we sort of just launched. And... Uh, that was a disappointment. So I was glad to see that and book. It was how, how much of that happened? How much of that happened? Like uh, overall, because like I mean, it, you know, a lot of fingers got pointed at you because you're kind of a public face. But yeah. I mean, how much control really did you have? Like I mean, it, you, it sounds like there's a lot of directives, especially about like kind of the larger property characters like Superman, like Batman, that like you don't even get to. Yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's a lot of expectations that you're supposed to meet, and a lot of things you got to watch out for. A lot of those things aren't. It doesn't seem as, as stringent as it was when I was there. I, I used to use this. I'm gonna without going into the specifics. What I'll say to this is that uh, when you're in a position in any job, and I'll say this about any job. Uh, especially a position of authority, um, and you're being told or asked to be doing different things with that responsibility, your job that against what you want to do, it's your responsibility sort of take the, the shot for it. You know what I mean? Because if you yeah. don't take the hit, then ultimately people see your position as weak and go around you and start to talk to other people. Um, so in order to maintain some level of authority, you have to take good hits with the bad hits. You know what I mean? In order to uh, in order to maintain the role. So it was part of the job coming in. There's a lot of ideas that I would have liked to do that never got done. But then on the other side, there's a lot of things that I never thought we'd get made that did get made. So, you know, it's a balancing act. You know, and it's, it's, I don't think anybody has full control of anything they ever do, including people who do create their own books. You know, just because of this constant limitations put on you, whatever you wind up doing. But do you feel like you have more control here uh, with Frank Miller than than before? Like, is it is it much more of a yeah? Definitely, because no, look, we got Sven <laughs> There are there are different concerns. There are different issues. I mean, there's no possible way Frank Miller wanted to do that Sven Gulli book. That is 100 percent Dan DiDio. Dan DiDio loves Sven Gulli, who was like a cable access, like not not even cable, like local access, public access. Is that what it's called? Uh, <laughs> like horror movie host uh old-fashioned style uh and you can watch him in new york i don't know if he's uh all over i don't know if he's syndicated but when i saw that like 
Frank Miller Publishing or Frank Miller Presents had a Sven Gulli book. I'm like, this is like Dan DiDio's dream come true. Jose M says, diversity in coughing with your boy Zach is a more truer name. Yeah, I'm happy to hear his cough again. Uh, Neon Knight Rider says, uh, I'd be dope to get an EVS cover. It'd be dope, I think you meant. Uh, to get an EVS cover for Frank Miller Presents Ronin Sin City. Um. Yeah, uh, listen, I mean, when it comes to Dan, if he needs me, I'm there. But I, I, I'm i not expecting anything ever again, guys. Understand that, like, when it comes to, like, the mainstream and all of the people from my past, I just assume I've thrown lob multiple hand grenades over my shoulder behind me uh, and uh, blown the fuck, blown them to smithereens. I, I don't expect anything. I don't expect Dan to ever contact me uh, ever again. Uh, not until we're like, uh, 80 years old, maybe, uh, I just don't expect it. I'm not looking for it moving forward. It's, it's all up to me. I mean, to do this stuff. Uh, when I said, uh, one of the things I said to Dan was DC's going to regret this because I have 26,000 subscribers who are on my side on YouTube. And if they know that I'm being mistreated and persecuted by SJWs and DC didn't stand up for me, they're going to be angry at DC. And Dan said, yep, I know, I know. <laughs> 26,000 subscribers. Uh, and I've made good on that promise, at least, you know. Uh, so, uh, but I said, I'd never say anything bad about Dan or the good people who uh, put me to work for 20 years over there. I did good work at DC uh, and uh, loved it there. Absolutely loved my time there. Uh, sometimes I'm sad that I'm still not drawing for DC. There, there are times where I get kind of melancholy about that. Um, but it's not often, you know, it's not often that I feel that way, but, uh, yeah, I, I still love that company. The great part about it is I got to do my own series with ancient enemies, which is what I really wanted to do with this. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and, and with Frank also, uh, you know, he gave me a lot of leeway, believe me, <laughs> Was, but working on the Spanguli book was something that's a personal friend of mine, so I really wanted to do something for people I knew. So that that was a wonderful opportunity. There you go, Spanguli. Uh, and it's great to be able to work with Frank on that side as well. He's doing the books he wants. And right now, I'm probably taking it a step back from the writing side just to make sure. I mean, I got to say, you know, Dan, to be fair, one. like I can't imagine Spanguli sold 100 copies. It, there's no, I got to know what that sold. I mean, Sin City, Ronin, you know, these books are going to be your big sellers, obviously. I'm sure they're doing great. Sven Gulli is like, uh, that's a, that is a passion project that you're just, you are throwing money into the furnace. There's no way that book is selling at all. Impossible. Expect it. You're entitled to give him the finger, says Travis Parrott. Yeah. Melancholy is code for gay. <laughs> it is gay. Uh, let me see. Uh, it goes on there. Earth 3 version of EVS, Ethan Van Bridge Builder. Uh, I think I was that before, but it doesn't pay. I mean, I, I just feel like these people are mentally ill. I feel like there, there are people in the the, the kind of demand group think, uh, and uh, they need to swim together in a school. And uh, if you have a different thought, they will uh, disassociate with you. Well, there's a lot of that. I, I, you know, that's definitely true in the mainstream. I can't be like that. I, I can't. I mean, I can only feign respect for people who are clearly stupid for so long. I can't do it. I can't do it for very long. Eventually, I'm going to say what I actually think. Watch out. It's going to happen. Eventually, I'm going to tell the truth about people. I can't do it. I can't. F I, I can't do it. That's not who I am. I wish I could. But people drive me fucking crazy. Oh, things that just seem so obvious to me. Things just seem like, yeah, of course, that's a, are controversial. I don't I don't get it. And I can't. I can't just pretend. So but I am. What I am is what I am is what I am or what. <laughs> How does that song go? Oh, and that's the thing. Like, you know, you're working around a lot of people who are uh, fucking awful people, just awful people. Uh, and uh, they believe stupid shit. 
and they're hypocrites. And I just, uh, I, I can't, I can't do it. At the same time, you have really good people. Uh, I really think Dan DiDio was a good person. Uh, I really like Jeff Johns. Uh, had a good time with Pete Tomasi. You know, there are good people over there. Shane Davis was great at DC. I'm so glad he came over here. I'm really glad that Shane's with us. I would have missed Shane. I wish Pat Gleason was here because Pat Gleason's very much like Shane Davis, like just in terms of his good nature. I mean, Shane's become insane. You know, let's be honest. But uh, Shane's a good-natured fellow, um, and he's uh, introspective and smart, and, and he's honest uh, and all of these things. I, I think Pat Gleason is the same kind of guy. I'd love Pat to come over here. I liked Ivan Rice a lot, him and his family. They were, they're were they great people. Um, but uh, at the same time, you know, I don't even have to name their names because you kind of know, you know, you're just, you're just shitheads. Um, so... Uh, what is this choose, by the way? Choose Shane. I keep seeing people say chew. Uh, hmm. Shane hides his good nature very well. <laughs> He's such a good guy, man. Shane is like a really, really good person. Uh, all right. You know. He's just trying to make it. He's he's a, an excellent creative person, a, a fantastic artist, a guy with a great design sense, really terrific writer. Uh, he and Yanzi are working together like a uh, team supreme. And uh, Shane deserves all of the uh, wealth, all the success that he gets. Running the company. Uh, and while you're writing and while you're trying to get the company rolling, uh, something's got to give. So you're always making compromises. And uh, so now I want to take a half step back and uh, and just make sure everything's running smoothly and then figure out what, to go, what happens after that, you know? Cool. I was wondering about that because I read it. No. Uh, once you read into Ancient Enemies, uh, guys, you really set up. Um, I mean, it is a superhero universe at the end of the day. Yeah. But you set up world building that's like there's a world of aliens and uh, and and uh, events that happen around them and uh, a kind of it's not exactly a post apocalyptic future. Like it, it kind of it could have gone that way, but they rebuilt and then the the, the setup of the geography, the politics is all different uh, than it is now. So you, so you really put a ton into the world building to where it seems like this is not just meant for a six issue limited series. It's meant for mm -hmm. like an ongoing bigger deal. Is that, is that, was that your intention? It, to begin with? I, I wish I could say that was the case, but I kind of just can't help making, I have to understand the worlds <laughs> I'm working in. So I got to build them all the way out, you know, to a place where I feel comfortable. So that way, when you start to touch on corners, um, you have understanding of how the world works and what's happening, what the politics are, because it's important. And even if it just gives some sort of contextual understanding to the characters, for me, it's, <laughs> it, it just enriches everything you're doing. And, <laughs> and while you touch upon it in different places, it, it allows the story to hold together much better. Because when I started Ancient Enemies, we were going to go oversized books, and then there was some... Because I just live stream, that's all. Size, and then pulling out the origins of the primary characters. Into I can grow my channel. I just have to be consistent about making um, recorded videos. I found all I had a lot of fun doing that. And I... And because I understood Hard. how the world worked, I was able to build a rather consistent story, even though I was coming at it from several different angles and with multiple artists. And, and in issues four and five, you actually put in backup stories, yeah. uh, like in, in there. I mean, that when I when when I got to that and saw that, well, actually, I, I guess uh, there's backup stories before that too. But yeah. uh, but the, but uh, when I when I saw the backup stories in there, just that were short backup stories, I was like, this really feels like the old DC comics of yore, like with like adventure comics and House of yeah. Mystery and things like that. Just really having like that extra featurette in there. Uh, that was something that that really struck a classic DC for me. Yeah, I also did the what's what pages. <laughs> yes, you did. That's right. That was an issue too. <laughs> not uh, who's who. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I have no, 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 no copyright who. infringement. No, I know what a one is, not a who who. <laughs> you know, That's but so it's, funny. you know, it's what I love about I, I love short form storytelling. I absolutely adore it because it really does. If you're not if you're not writing on a regular basis, it, what it does it really tests tests your skills to be able to tell something concise and complete and have a little bit of emotional beat and some sort of conclusion. Um, <laughs> is it like that? Of time, so it's important this is a very classy classic. interview. You like, guys don't like it because it's not like uh, what? There's no violence in it. There's no cursing. All right, let me skip ahead. This is when. Uh, all right, this is when. Uh, hold on a second. It's supposed to get good. Let's go to minute twenty-five more easily uh, to enjoy than some of the stuff that's a little overwrought and overwritten these days. I, I actually like that about your world talking about the fantasy element. And I, I think what I, what I see a lot of when I, when I see a lot of uh, I guess uh, elements out of the, the big two these days, I, I see them try to insert a lot of like real world political headlines there we like, go. Right into there. And with yours, like you actually have a political struggle going on, but the world's so different that you set up that 
uh, like the Citadel versus the Americana nice. sort of thing doesn't feel like something that's happening in 2023. It, fe it feels like something future and different. And so it is like a world immersion thing where you've actually provided some immersion by adding that element that's not real. It's fantastical. Dan right? knows um, just what he's talking I, about. I, I, don't know, I don't know why people, uh, it, it shouldn't be that hard, I don't think. But, like, well, really I mean, the, you know, whatever Dan says here, here, a failing of Dan is that he decided way back in 2007, I think it was, the 2007 or 2008, I can't remember what election it was. It was 2011, maybe. But he he was doing this. Uh, he says we're going to do this book, Ethan, called DC Time to Choose or something, and we're going to establish the political associations or leanings of every DC superhero. I said, No, Dan, no, Dan, don't do it. He said, uh, We're going to do it. Uh, so people, it'll be fun because people can guess who's going to vote for who, who's a Republican, who's a Democrat. I said, no, Dan, don't. And he said, nope, we're doing it already. And it was dog shit. So, you know, Dan talking about, uh, I was begging him not to do it. Dan and I were close like that. And I would sit there and talk to him directly. I, I'm, I'm, I was no different then than I am now. I will tell you when it's when I think what you have is not a good idea when you're doing the wrong thing. And I begged him, I said, please don't like that is really that is really going to harm these characters long term. I don't I don't want to know if Superman is a Republican or a Democrat. I never want to know that. I'm going to assume he's a Republican. I'm going to assume Batman is a Republican. He's like, oh, but Ethan, he's like, what if Bruce Wayne is the opposite of what Batman is? I said, that's Almost interesting, but not interestingly enough, interesting enough to do this to DC characters. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, the fact of the matter is it didn't completely undo everything only because it was it just was not a memorable event and it wasn't very good. Uh, but it was a terrible idea. And I think that, you know, um, the political atmosphere of Obama of those days made Dan feel like they needed to do something like that. Uh, but it was a uh, fucking, oh God, it was awful. I was terrified. I was really terrified about that. All right. So Dan, I think has learned his lesson. You know, <laughs> as I have to say, cartoonists are the ones that see the, the, the mirror image of the mirror image of the real world and tell it in a, in a humorous matter in order to get a point across. They use humor to, to tell the story. Um, in comics, we use fantasy and science fiction and things of that nature. The whole purpose of science fiction is to tell a story through allegory so that people can understand it from a pure entertainment aspect. But if you get something more out of it, so much the better. And those are the things that have the lasting effect. Um, without that allegory, and if you hit it real, you have this really hard kind of the fantasy of the superhero versus the reality of reality. You know, if, I always put that in while I, while I applaud things like the books from 9-11 and things of that nature. When you put the superheroes at 9-11... Um, it's just, it doesn't feel right to me. You know what I mean? It doesn't create, it doesn't create fun. And like, um, I remember at the time I, I, I saw, especially the Spider-Man issue with it was like actually a pretty emotionally hard hitting yeah, exactly. uh, story regarding that. And, uh, I guess it stuck with me. I mean, I remember it, but do I want to go back and read that again at this point? Yeah. I mean, anytime Mark really, wants I mean, to come like, on the stream, he's, it, it, yeah, it's not, he's it, it wasn't invited. on the fun level. Yeah. Uh, it, it made, me, it made a stark like reality, like being like, and it makes you think, why am I wasting my time sitting here reading Spider-Man? Like the real world's like a, a, a lousy place. Yeah. And it should, you should want the opposite feeling. Like I want to, I want to just have my escape from the real world. Right. <laughs> Listen, you have yeah. to, you have to, you have to, you have to suspend reality and absorb the fantasy whenever you're doing a comic book story or else it doesn't make sense. Okay. Yeah. So once you put too much reality in there, um, the fantasy gets harder to take and it's harder to embrace it. Um, so therefore you need to really find a way to, create stories to get that same point across i mean nine it's in ancient enemies 9 nine eleven is over the entire book it's the it's the heart of the story the, the yeah they blow up they, the craft blows up it, it crashes into new york right yeah exactly it takes, oh, it takes yeah. the entire city there's a whole yeah. sequence that takes place at a memorial site um and i go into that a great deal and even with the first i did a one shot called first responder where he goes back to his firehouse uh, after being transformed into an alien seeing his photo on the wall of one of the All right, let me look at you guys here in the chat for a second this is good i actually like dan didio saying these things because they're common sense things that will enrage us JWs, uh, you know. Uh, let me see. All the dead superheroes voted blue. Uh, Enrico Wellborn says, it was a little boring, but it was still interesting. John did good. I'm really proud of John is doing an excellent job in this interview. 9-11 uh, books, what, says Luis Val Velez. Hey, Luis, like after 9-11 happened, um, uh, there were a lot of books that were like to benefit 
um, firefight, like the families of the emergency workers who lost their lives. And they were, they were, they weren't good. I mean, but they were a lot of books of like superheroes crying over in the rubble and, you know, all this stuff. It was uh, of its time. Like everybody wanted to mourn and nobody really knew how except to just draw pictures of the towers and draw pictures of firefighters. And, you know, it was uh, 2001. Uh, let me see. Eric July hired Mike Barron last week. Thoughts? Uh, I'm happy Mike Barron's getting uh, work, man. I, I Mike Barron, of course, is a comic skate king. He's on the show every week, and he's doing his own thing. Like he's been doing uh, a bunch of hard scrabble, kind of right wing sort of themed uh, comics. You know, straight from the uh, the news. Uh, he's terrific, you know. So uh, yeah, Mike Barron going over there and doing a little uh, a comic book uh, for Eric July. I wish him well. Like I hope he makes a whole lot of money doing that. Uh, I've got Mike Barron doing something else for me, something a little bit bigger. Um, and uh, that'll get announced in due time. He's uh, We're going to take good care of Mike. Let me see here. Um, Narwhal says, uh, Hotel Story is live. I heard you promoted it. E. Thank you so much. Everyone back to Cyberfrog to show support for E supporting me. Well, yeah, let me just take a look real quick. Hotel Story uh, is uh, live on Indiegogo right now. Just launched today. Uh, this is uh, Per Berg, otherwise known as Narwhal. <laughs> I don't know why he's called Narwhal. Why did I do that to him? Uh, but Narwhal's Hotel Story is live right now on Indiegogo. Uh, run over there and back it. Support our friend and uh, your friend, too. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Mike Barron wrote some of my favorite comics, Nexus and Badger. Yeah, well, I hope you're supporting Mike Barron's um, other projects. Uh, he's currently working with Pat Broderick uh, on a book over at Fund My Comic called Bronze Star. Oh, my God. I almost forgot the title of it. I hate when that happens. Bronze Star on Fund My Comic. Uh, should be really, really good. Well, Red Comic says, don't look at us. We're being naughty. James K says, look at me, Ethan. Look at me. I have pie. I wish I had some pie. Crying in the rubble instead of actually stopping the planes. Yeah, like, here's the thing. Uh, in what kind of universe, comic book universe, would 9-11 even happen? You know, superheroes would have stopped that pretty easily. Like, they stopped that kind of shit all the time, so it was a little weird. Peter Man says, we joke now, but it was a horrible year. That was a bizarre kind of thing. I was invited to be a part of the Marvel pinup book, and I just said, I don't want to do it. My, my whole thing was, I don't want to do it. I don't want to draw this. Like, I was having all kinds of different feelings. Uh, <laughs> Narwhal says, ooh, thanks. Yeah, everybody loves Narwhal. Hopefully, uh, his book is going to do well. Uh, all caps, Mike Barron is an automatic buy, says uh, Forrest Publishing. Oh, you're going to be surprised when you see what it is. Um. DC derailed for me when Superman catchphrase changed from truth, justice, and American way. Uh, was changed. I discover Ripaverse and EVS Comicsgate uh, Hell CG. That's pity mod there. Um, yeah, it's weird. They're like embarrassed of Americanism. Friggin' Doctor Doom crying because 9/11 thumbs down. I know. Like, did you have to do that? Like, maybe the villains like were not. You know. Maybe the villains were not exactly moved by the uh, disaster of 9/11. Why? Why would they be? You know, they do stuff like that all the time. But again, it was, uh, I think they were trying to say it was such a terrible, heinous act that even Dr. Doom was stunned by its uh, perfidy. Uh, that shit was the gayest thing in comics before the current Dark Age. So Skynex. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dan Didio did nothing wrong. I agree. He's a good guy. Claude Parrish says, I'm a big fan of Mike Barron. I don't go around bragging that I'm his friend, but he is my friend. <laughs> you should brag. He's a great guy. Yeah, we love Mike Barron. He shows up on Comics Gate Kings, and he goes to bed at 8 p.m. You know, he, he, listen, he goes to bed early, wakes up early, works all day, goes to bed. That's just the way it is. All right, let me see. I'm lost in the, in the, in the crash. And That's what tipped me off to the allegory, actually. So when, when I didn't actually think about 
the allegory being for 9-11, I just thought, oh, alien crash, it blew up yeah. all this stuff. And I was not in it at all on that level. I was just reading the story. Huh. But when but when I saw the name First Responder, I thought, oh, I understand this now. Yeah. And that would give me an aha moment. I, I forgot that about really that. Well yeah, he did. So, and, that's, yeah. and that's the goal. And then what you see. Yeah. That was the, that was the worst. That was probably like the worst night of my life. Uh, <laughs> shit. Oh. Yeah, like I was being interviewed. And uh, this was like before cancel culture was really a thing yet uh, but i was being interviewed and uh they said they said so how did you end up getting a uh, green Lantern rebirth and i said well you know um here's what happened like dan didio was new to the company and he brought me into the office he said, i got a project for you for after batman catwoman when you're finished that i got a project for you he said come in here sit down in my office because it's kind of weird and i said um Okay, so I'm relaying this story, but I'll relay it to you too. So uh, Dan said, uh, listen, we're doing a dark, we're taking the Silver Age and we're going to do a dark murder mystery. Check this out. We're going to rape Sue Dibney. And then like, uh, you know, there's going to be a murder, et cetera, et cetera. So me saying that Dan DiDio said, we're going to rape Sue Dibney. I said it on an interview just like that. Went over the air and Bleeding Cool picked it up. Rich Johnson picked it up and quoted me, quoting Dan DiDio, quote, unquote, we're going to rape Sue Dibney as a Bleeding Cool headline. I was at a convention with Dan when this happened. Dan called me up. Some Actually, somebody from D.C. came over to my table after the interview was done and handed me the phone. This is Dan. Dan's on the phone. Dan screaming at me like nothing I've ever heard before in my life. Uh, Dan, what the fuck? Like screaming in my ear over the phone. Uh, and Dan's a friend of mine, but he's my boss too. Did you say that I said we're going to rape Sue, didn't you? I said, you did say that to me. That's what you said. You don't say that to me. <laughs> I was like terrified. I thought I lost my whole fucking job. Oh my God, he's screaming like like you wouldn't believe uh, over that. And uh, his uh, then girlfriend, now wife, just said uh, called me up and said, "Ethan, I'm taking care of him. Don't worry." I was like, "Please take care of him, Jesus." Uh, Hail Ethan and CG. Happy Sunday, says uh, Eric Winberg. Yeah, I had to retract it. I said, "Well, maybe he didn't quite say it that way." Oh, that was the fucking worst shit ever. That sucked. But uh, it is what it is. And they'd already had this narrative because apparently somebody else reported that, like, Dan got excited when the, like, the rape, quote, unquote, rape pages from, uh, uh, what was it called? What was the book called? Identity Crisis came in. The rape pages are in. And uh, they quoted him saying that before. I didn't know that. I didn't know that was a big problem. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was like, uh, I was like, I don't understand what the situation is. We're, we're telling a story here. And. You know, it's, oh, we can't be gleeful about a fictional rape scene. And I said, gleeful? Like, I don't, you know, it's just a story. You know, like, I don't, I don't get what the problem is. That was then. Now I fucking get what the problem is because you can't, you know, if you said something like that nowadays, uh, you would be, your whole life would be destroyed. Uh, but it was, uh, yeah, good woman. Yeah, I know. <laughs> She's like, I'm taking care of him, Ethan. Don't worry. I'm calming him down. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah that was horrible absolutely horrible uh james k says ethan if you miss working in the mainstream comics industry i can call you up and scream in your ear uh that's okay i <laughs> it was like that it was terrifying dude he was like ranting and raving and panting and just like so mad at me i was like do you want to do you want to come punch me dan do you want to i'll stand here you can hit me as hard as you want right in the face uh, your friend Bat says it's all Brad Meltzer's fault. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah to be fair. Uh, <laughs> here's Motley Poo. Hey, Ethan, when does your review of uh, Patrick Tomlinson's gay book air? That's a great question. I'm going to be doing it chapter by chapter uh, because one video isn't enough. We're going to be reviewing one chapter at a time uh, and discussing the experience of reading one of Patrick Tomlinson's uh, famous novels. Uh, which uh, I did purchase called Starship Repo. And uh, it is 
man, I just, I hate SJWs. I hate the way they think. I hate the way they talk. Uh, FP Sunday goes, yeah, what's wrong with rape? It's just a story. Well, yeah, like it's, listen, it's murder. You know, we, we, okay, Ethan, guess what? We're going to kill Martian Manhunter. Well, murder is awful. That's terrible. Why are we gleeful about murdering? Oh, because it's fiction. Because it's fiction. And because the, the crime of the story is from, you know, where everything else kind of comes from. The rest of the story happens because of the heinousness of the crime. It's all fiction. Settle down. A wandering CG King Marduk Knight says, EBS the sitcom. That was so bad, dude. Travis Park says uh, it's not grape as long as there's a condom on. Yeah, that's the uh, that's what they're saying. Uh, let me see. Narwhals here. I hope Tomlinson's book is as good as his stand up. Oh, get ready, guys. Uh, EVS, you should review Smiller's book. Oh, wait, you can't because he doesn't fulfill his campaigns. That's cold. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, in a new context and hopefully get more out of this. I forgot all about better. that you know, story. Me, Thank I, you I for reminding me. Oh, it's the worst show. night of my life. Either. And you know what? You can't help but be moved by it. Um, but do I want to do a comic about it? No, but, but can I use that? But as a writer, you're constantly pulling information from everywhere. You're constantly absorbing personalities and, and talking trends and ideas and things that are happening all around you. And you're putting into this giant meat grinder and kicking out, kicking out concepts and stories and, and, that stuff is, is just grist for the mill. You know, how, how do you, where do you get your ideas from? It's from everywhere. You have to be out there and exposed to so much going on and absorbing it, but just don't seeing it for its face value, figuring it out on how do you, you take aspects of it to merely murk for the story you're telling, not to beat a drum, so to speak, you know? Cool. Yeah, I 100% I agree. So guys, uh, the concept here is there's two alien crafts that, that crash on Earth. And like one of them, basically the US government hires a corporation and they build this like sea lab around it, like to like extract all the technology from. The other one is lost somewhere. And uh, and the two aliens are at war for generations, uh, however long it is. And they start to kind of awaken w as they take over the bodies of people uh, in uh, Dan's world right here. Meanwhile, Dan set up this corporation with like this corporate superhero group that's actually helping like and they're kind of helping. But there's this whole outcast group that's also like not getting helped by them because the corporation's just kind of screwing everybody at the same time while trying to do good. It's it's a huge like this world is a lot for six issues. So it's, 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 um, it's, it, encom it encompasses my entire life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's all I got to say. Yeah. Uh, let me see here. Yeah. Like, why don't I review uh, one of these comics? Because I got one of the Ronin books, and I honestly, it was incomprehensible, Travis. I, I tried to read it. It was, I, I can't remember which number it was, but it was uh, it was incomprehensible. It was like a, a severed head was, I, I guess you had to be there, or, you know, maybe I missed a bunch of issues, but, uh, you know, I, I politely say it, it's not for me. Like, Sin City might be for me. And frankly, Sven Gulli might be more for me. But uh, yeah, Ronan, like the one the one book, I, well, I do have a copy of Sven Gulli. Somebody did send it to me. Uh, but yeah, Ronan was like, uh, you know, not not that good. Uh, what are you going to have, Dan DiDio and CG Kings? Everybody would like to see that, I know. It would be very nice. Uh, time to make Ancient Enemies number one. Maybe I, yeah, maybe read that. Maybe I'll read that. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> after working after working for companies for over 40 years, trust me, you, you can't help but write about a corporation that screws people. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and that touched me too. I, I I definitely relate to corporations screwing people. So, yeah. um, <laughs> can you guys hear me now? But uh, I, 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 I always, yeah, I, always, I used to use an expression that I actually hold on a second. Muted. Can you guys hear me? Or am I muted? Hell, yellow flash. People are saying. Um. Very clear. Okay. I don't know. Was I muted for a second? All right. Let's keep going. Put in the book, which I used to say corporations don't have values. Corporations have profits. So, you know, the only time they have values is if they think it's going to add to their profits. So when people start to talk about what a company stands for, a company stands for money. That's all they ever do. And if you ever think anything more than that, you're misguided. You know, they, they present themselves differently. And what I like to do is pull back that veneer just to make sure that when we see the people inside the company, while they're talking quietly amongst themselves, they understand exactly what their, their purpose is, even if everybody else is seeing it for something else. ESG, guys. That's what he's saying. Companies are all about profits. But you know what? Here's the thing. Yeah, the companies are doing what they're doing for profits, ESG. Uh, but they're working hand-in-hand -hand with activists who help them get to that point. 
That's all it is. The activists are more than happy. See, they just work together. Creeps, weird leftists are more than happy to make this garbage uh, so that they can uh, qualify uh, for a high social credit score. Well, there's, there's a lot of hoobaloo about that. And, and there's so much like political culture war crap going on in comics now, too, with finger pointing. And all. Do you attribute most of that on the corporate level then to like incompetence when, when st stuff starts to slide in that direction? Like it's not intentional um, uh, or... Or there's just I, a few people who are really loud and and I, I think I think it's just, the attention. Yeah, I think it's a few people loud and a lot of people chasing something that they don't know. The the one thing you, you find out in the uh, in the corporate world very quickly is most of the people that work and produce things don't know anything about what they produce. Okay, they're not consumers <laughs> of their own. They, no, it sounds stupid, yeah. but it's just the truth. They're yeah. not consumers of their own product. So where do they get their information? On yeah, do you think Daniel Cherry the third knows anything about DC Comics? I read a couple interviews with him, and he doesn't know a goddamn thing. Uh, you know, none of those people, the new executives, see, this is what made Dan DiDio so unique. And uh, even Jim Lee doesn't know anything about DC Comics. Dan DiDio knows DC Comics. He knows everything about it. He eats, breathes, and sleeps these characters. And actually, it's not just DC Comics. It's more Marvel Comics. Like, his dream was to work on Spider-Man. So it was so great because, like, uh, he... Uh, you know, he belonged there. He was uniquely good at his job. And like everything in comics, if it's good, they cannibalize and destroy it. Like people were cheering when this guy lost his job. I, I, I honestly, it, when Wizard, when we lost Wizard Magazine, people were cheering about that. Drives me nuts. John Delarose, uh, hello, welcome. Of course, uh, this is a you did a great job. People should subscribe to John Delarose as a way of saying thank you, Travis Park. Thanks for a dollar. Appreciate that nice tip there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, here we go. Their product is being succeed, succeeding or failing. They go online now. They're pulling information <laughs> from these websites and conversations. I'm not. So what you have now is you have- I, I truly liked him. I thought he was good. You, um, and ultimately aligning with them, which they want, they want to believe the most. And then using that sense to basically validate the choices they're making inside the product, whether it needs it or not. Um, wow, that's a that's a lot of mental gymnastics right there. Jeez, I, I, it, it, is, <laughs> it is. But that's that's you ask how things are made. That's how things are made. That's how things are made. Cool. With, and it's usually, um, about, and usually about twenty people in the room making that agreement. By the way, <laughs> I do want to I do want to uh, get the super chat about uh, the story here because we are sure, talking about Asian enemies. Is the story self contained? Uh, ask Mike. Thank you for two dollars. Appreciate it. Yeah, the two. Yes, uh, there is a conclusion. So when I have a battle between, I always say when you set up a thing where there's a fight between two characters, um, you want to know who the winner is. We definitely see who the winner is at the end of the, the sixth issue. Excellent. But, that is that is not how, how superhero versus superhero battles typically go in Marvel. Uh, DC, it, so. it, it isn't. Yeah. Um, but I feel that again, if you have people investing in the story, <laughs> if I were trying to get hired at DC, it wouldn't be uh, by flattering else, Dan um, Then uh, it's almost like it's cheap, um, you know. And while you can leave room and leave, trust me, if you read the last few pages, there's room for a lot of other things to happen because I, I give you places where everything can go. But there is a conclusion to the the story, the conflict that was set up at the start. That's great. Cool. All right. So uh, if you guys don't know, uh, Dan is not only doing his own book here, but he is uh, overseeing the publishing of Frank Miller Presents also, which is all Frank Miller stuff. And uh, gosh, uh, Frank Frank Miller is uh, one of the original canceled people in comics. Um, and uh, and uh, I saw him at San Diego Comic Con. Oh, my gosh. Uh, like uh, he's he's uh, I, I hate to say this. He's gotten old and I'm, it's making me sad. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, honestly, I, uh, I want him to continue forever. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. First of all, I, I adore Frank. I think I think he's just one of the one of the, strangely, one of the nicest and, and true lovers of comics. He, he does comics because he enjoys it. Uh, I mean, really enjoys it. And um, it's been a pleasure working with him. I've known him for a long time. Um, we didn't really set out to start anything. We started out with a conversation, really, just talking about what we like about comics. And it, instead of sitting there and bitching about what we liked or didn't like in comics, we said, why don't we do the books that we like, whether it worked or not? You know, at least we feel that we put our interpretation, our voice, and what we think comics should be on the table. Um, you know, you know, one thing we I don't talk about it with ancient enemies, but one of my biggest concerns with ancient enemies was I absolutely hate coloring in comics today. I mean, I think they're they're murky, they're dark, me too, they're, they're muddy, over um, oversaturated, over and completely yeah. oversaturated. And uh, and you know, I sit down with we sat down with the colorists and I sat down with Alice Sinclair and we talked about this. And if you look at ancient enemies, the colors are really bright, really pop. Um, and I wanted to make this, sure that these books were speaking of colors in comics. Was yeah. this one your fault, Dan? Or what? was this after you? Was this, this one your fault, or did this come after that's you? That's after me. Is that the flocked one? Okay. That's, that's a, yeah, that's yeah this is the one where they cheat. Oh my god, they ruined Swamp yeah. Thing. That's after you. Yeah. I mean, oh my god. And so the coloring, yeah, it's a big deal. And what you did, you actually have um, 
colors that kind of harken back to the early 2000s where they were a lot brighter and more yeah. distinct uh, in ancient enemies. Yeah, uh, they, so, yeah, I agree yeah, with you. Very little, like I said, very little foreground background separation these days. It's almost, mm. and they're, they're, they're pasting a color, color over everything with no light source. Um, they're making skin tones the same color as backgrounds. I, I, I'm completely lost in that. And as I like to say, people are working on computer now. Um, <laughs> At least just because you can't. I just noticed my name is popping up. All through this, you guys in the chat are sitting there going, where's Ethan? He's lurking. Where? How come Ethan's not talking? I wasn't here. I, I would have uh, I would have definitely have super chatted a hello. I uh, hope you're doing well. Uh, I wasn't there. I was not. I, I was unable to attend this uh, live stream. I do not remember why. I think I was at a baseball game, but I could be wrong. Color because the program is there doesn't mean you should. Um, and on the other side of the coin, what I like to say is that your light source is behind the screen, not on top of the screen, and it changes the entire perspective when you're when you're oh, lighting sure. on top of a piece of when the light shows on the paper, not from behind the paper. So again, these are things that sounds almost silly to say in a weird way, but are important for me in regards to trying to get a point across saying look how books should look more so than just, just how they should read or what types of stories you should tell. And Frank felt the same way, and he wanted to get out there and do something bigger and bolder. Um, you know, he didn't want to be held down to the paper. I mean, and honestly, um, truth be told, you know, we don't have any digital copies because we didn't even give it a thought. We didn't want to do it digitally. We wanted to create a forms that made the book hard to read on a, on a screen. Um, you know, Frank's doing these double page, beautiful double page layouts that um, if you do it on a screen, are going to be shrunk to a point that it makes them almost unrecognizable. Um, same thing with the way Danilo was working. He was working very panoramic and looks beautiful on a printed page. I'm not sure how it looks on the digital. And we didn't give a concern. We weren't worried about that. We just wanted the book to look the best it should be in the format that we were building it for. That's really interesting because the, the way a lot of stuff's done now, it's almost like they build it for Webtoon and then yeah. throw it haphazardly into a book. And that doesn't look good on the paper so much. So you do have to keep in mind different formats and different mediums. And there's absolutely. a place for Webtoon. Oh, absolutely. On Webtoon. <laughs> I think Webtoons are, yeah. Webtoons are great. Don't get me wrong. It's a fabulous, yeah. but it's a different type of storytelling. It's a different reading experience. And therefore, it has to be laid out in a completely different way. One, comic books, when you produce a comic, everybody's so used to a periodical being turned into a graphic novel and you know and so on and so on an absolute or this they change a couple of sizes but that's about it but you got to realize now one size doesn't fit all and ultimately the one style of storytelling shouldn't fit all either the idea of writing six issues to tell one story unfortunately you know at the price point we're right right now for a periodical i think it's detrimental to the books themselves um you know absolutely because, you know, and they, they feel, the problem is that so many of them feel like they're written for well they're, a lot of them don't even feel like they're written for trade anymore they feel like they're written for omnibus yeah and it's like yeah. well i'm just i'm not even going to wait for the trade anymore i'm just going to wait for the omnibus of the run because like it's mm -hmm. it's so uh spread out at this point very very uh very true on that fact yeah so yeah. how many books um how many books are currently coming out i hear that online? all the right time now we had we had three titles at the one we launched with it was with um it was ancient enemies uh ronin book two and Pandora, which Frank created Pandora with Emma Kubrick. He wanted to do a young adult fantasy book. So we actually cool. launched, which was, Ronin was our science fiction anime manga adventure story. Uh, Ancient Enemies was more of our traditional superhero story. And then Pandora was our um, Pandora was our young adult fantasy. Uh, Pandora did a six issue miniseries. They're actually working on the next six issue arc right now uh, in production. Uh, so that'll come out in the beginning of next year. Um, Frank will be wrapping up Ronin probably by the beginning of next year as well. Just we had some production problems along the way. Um, and then, um, and then Frank's working on a Sin City prequel, which is interesting for us, called Blood and Dust, which is basically the origin of Basin City, how it came to be. Um, and he also has a one shot that he's working, you have the art up there right now, uh, with Mila Manera. So he actually wrote a story uh, for Mila Manera, and Milo's in the process of growing that as we speak. Wow, and Frank great. has a couple other series that we're talking about, potentially down the line. So we're managing the line as we go right now. The Svengoolie book was cool. something I wanted to do because, again, like I said, I was friends with the people. They, they were asking me. Who, could, who they could go to make a comic. And I said, I, I want to do it with them. So I, I had a blast working with them. Um, that was more of a one-off though. Um, we, we have potential for a second, but we're not sure when. Uh, but for the most part, we're keeping everything very tight and very, uh, a very, um, a very small publishing line, obviously, because a couple of reasons. There's only four people in the entire company. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that the quality Smiller is likes also, it. Frank uh, and Milo, sure. I'm there. Uh, we're said. actually doing this all on our own. So we don't have investors in the company or anything like that. So it, it really is, everything's on our shoulders to get it done right, you know? Cool. Um, Ronin, uh, I, I actually never read Ronin, uh, which I should probably remedy, but, uh, is Ronin two readable without Ronin one or, uh, should he, should he go back and like, uh, we did it. We did a, the opening of Ronin one. We did a 10 page reintroduction of just of the characters so that you understood sort of where we are, but it really is its own beast. The Ronin two stories that I did a Frank, he, as he told me had from the conclusion of the first Ronin. Um, when I was at DC though, we, we never had an interest in doing it, um, because we always wanted Frank to do more work with our characters and we knew we had only so much bandwidth. Um, so the fact is, Frank was able to be able to pull uh, aspects of his rights back from Ronin to be able to publish it here, was allowed him to be able to tell a story that he's been wanting to tell for 40 years. 
Yeah. Oh, wow. Cool. Good yeah. to know. Uh, we do have another question about ancient enemy from Mike has bad knees. Thank you for the sure. $5 super chat, my friend. How do yeah. the one shots fit in? Is there an order we should read them in? Absolutely. Um, the run shots fit in because they're really origin stories. Okay. So they're really the origin stories for each one of the characters and helps fill out the background, the background on all these characters um, on how they came to be before they actually take part in the ancient enemy story. Um, the, um, the genie one shot fits in between issues two and three. Um, the Wraith and Sun fits in between issues um, three and uh, four. Um, the greater good between four and five, and then uh, first responder between five and six. What I did is I put ancient enemies out on a bi-monthly schedule and then dropped the one shots in between. So there, there are things that completely stand alone. Every one shot is a complete standalone story, um, but there are aspects that things that happen in there that feed into the series as it goes forward. Um, one of my favorite, one of my favorite review is on the genie was, oh, and, and that's Man. one of the things that I'm thinking about right now <laughs> just to do it. Cause I, like you said, I put all those little backups in there and there's a lot of different things with the what's what pages and we built the map of the world. It's a lot of talking um, about and, uh, the, uh, the series, uh, the series yeah, awesome. that he's putting out. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, I'm going to open up questions now uh, and I will go through okay. the chats as we got them. You had a little gauntlet at the beginning here. So, uh, so oh, go for uh, it. I'm always, go. never sure I'm on this. Okay. Thank you for uh, becoming a YouTube member. Yeah, you've been to Comic Cons enough to. to yeah, yeah. Can you you could answer anything off the top of your head and have no problem, huh? No, not really. No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is what it is. You'd be and surprised. You in the room. <laughs> Thank you for the uh, two dollars super sticker. I appreciate it. Um, the worst thing I asked. So I actually asked uh, when I, when I was like, gosh, eighteen, nineteen, and I was really. Pablo Diablo. I haven't like watched it yet. So I mean, and, uh, it. I uh, I walked up at San Diego Comic Con. I know it's some yeah, some of you are right, bored so by this. We'll get to the air July I mean, videos got, in a minute. Yes, I, mean, it's it's just like, I don't know how you can possibly do all that and keep it going. And I I just kind of rambled about it for a while. And he just pauses and sighs and he goes, "Dude, you just asked me where ideas come from." Yeah. <laughs> and I said, "I'm sorry." Yeah. Uh, yellow flash. Here we go. Let's let's do this. Uh, thank you for the twenty dollars super twenty dollars for this thing. Yeah, what a guy. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, Mister Didio. Please help hey. me understand why you let Super Sons get ruined by aging up John Kent, and then also letting Brian Bendis run Superman into the ground. Wow. Bendis. <laughs> yellow uh, flash. Rebirth, Superman was fantastic, and so was Super Sons. Yeah, I, I loved uh, Jurgen's work uh, out yeah. there. He did yeah, such yeah, a good yeah. job. Jer um, Jurgen's, you know, is going to go down to history as one of the greatest Superman storytellers. Let's, let's be honest, guys. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, you know, he, you can't beat that. That's all. You no, know, that's I mean, all he, is, nobody, he does the character so well. And it, it, it's funny. You got, can I just I'm digress for a second? I'll get right to the story. Sure. Um, I just got to digress because your, your Bender story, I had the same story with Dan Jurgens when I was younger. Okay. Right? When I was younger, not, not young, young, but when, when Booster Gold came out, I hated Booster Gold. So I gave Dan Jurgens shit at a convention once about Booster Gold, about why he's stealing Legion rings, why he's doing all these things. Dumb character. Dan, super, super nice to me. Um, there, but you know, he sort of blew, blew off my question. Twenty years later, I'm working with Dan, and I go, "Listen, Dan, um, I don't know, but I was this guy that gave you a hard time about Booster Gold." And he looked at me, and goes, "I have no clue what you're talking about." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get so many questions like that, you exactly. probably, probably have so no idea. Right? Yeah. That's where all this stuff goes on here. Let's go through this. Okay, Super Sons okay. one. Super Sons, possibly yeah, one of my good. favorite concepts at DC. I bought all those World's Finest issues that were all the Super Sons issues for such a long time, and I loved it so much that I was constantly trying to find a way to work Super Sons back into the DC universe, but. People didn't want it at the time, so until like I couldn't pull that trigger until Jim and I became publishers. Then I pulled the trigger mm -hmm. on uh, on Super Sun. So I wanted and those were the those were like the best DC books of the last decade. They're so sure. they're so yeah. they're, they're great. Pete Tomasi is amazing. They did, and he's and he had such heart in that story, which was great. And it was against what I thought Damien's character was, but he played it so well that that you just wanted that book to continue. Um, but like everything, you're constantly forced in a situation. Where you're constantly trying to renew and get things going. And we honestly, honestly. Um, you know, when Ben just came on over to DC and we were super excited about that, you know, I, I wanted him to do more Batman and he felt that was expected. So he wanted to try something different. He actually gave us a really strong pitch for Superman that we thought was going to come together. But unfortunately, Ben just got really sick. Um, and, and oh, really? Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I got sick for a while and, uh, and, uh, and, and everything sort of cooled down. So things were sort of moving in half steps. So it never really got the proper launch pad. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know when, you have, when you have an incredible writer, and Bendis is an incredible writer. You got you got to give them that leeway to give them that opportunity to succeed or fail. And some people liked it strong, some people worked against it. But you have to give them that choice. You have to let them be themselves. That's that's why you hire them. Uh, you know what I mean? So and that's that's what it's all about. So um, I, what I like to say is that I understand what you're saying. Um, aging up Jonathan Kent was supposed to be a different story um, because we were going to go somewhere with that. We never went to where it was going to go, and that's why that didn't work. The high concept was mm. the high concept was. Um, that Superman was going to become a threat in the future. And Jonathan Kent was brought into the future by the Legion of Superheroes to train himself to stop his father. 
um, from becoming what was going to happen. That's a cool story. You know what wow. I mean? That, and that's why he disappears because he's in the, the future with the Legion. So the Legion stories are with Jonathan Kent, Legion training Jonathan to stop something horrible that's going to happen in the past with his father, and he's the only one who could do it. That was going to be the story. They never got there. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Is that? And I guess that, I mean, this sounds like this happens a lot. I mean, you mentioned the Stephanie Brown origin story yeah. kind of didn't work on that. Yeah. Like, it sounds like with reboots and restarts and having, and let's let's be honest with the comic collector market, like, some if it says number one on it, somebody's going to go buy it. And if it says number 55 yeah. on it, they're not going to go buy it. And, and you do have that problem where you do have to have that constant cycling of relaunches. It sounds it, like that it, messes up a lot. Yeah, and, that, and, that, and, and, and that's just a, a real unfortunate shame of the business right now, I'm sorry to say, is that the fact that we have to go to such lengths to redrive or restart an engine, um, because ultimately you see diminishing returns with every, every number one that comes out there. And the, the faster that those number ones appear, the lower the threshold is for the sales on that book. Um, mm -hmm. and you're kind of, and that, which ultimately forces the, uh, the forces the, uh, the thing to happen, you know? So anyway. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yellow flash. Next gauntlet question. Callum, I think the Australian, <laughs> which I think only comes out to about like 15 cents in America, <clears throat> but, uh, <laughs> Has Jim Lee always been weak-willed, complicit, unable to say no to people? Wow, that shuts fire because he clearly does not care about the company he's supposed to lead. Damn! <laughs> you know, uh, listen, I worked side-by-side -side with Jim for 10 years, um, and uh, I, I found no better partner to work with. Um, so, you know, I, I can't answer a question like that. You know, that's that's a matter of interpretation. Um, I met know, him. He seems nice to me. So, I don't, listen, I don't know Jim, that. Jim, Jim, yeah. Jim, Jim loves comics, first of all. Uh, he loves the comic business, and he cares about what's going on. So, <laughs> there's so many... <laughs> I love nice that. Say, there are so many external forces that put upon everyone um, that it's, it, it seems that somebody may not be focused as distracted, but it's only because there's so many hours in a day. But uh, trust me, Jim's yeah. interest, interest in DC are always first and foremost, even from the time. And you were, you were in a no-win position a lot there, too. Yeah. I mean, I, I, was, you know, I, yeah. Somebody, somebody's, look, I always used to say my job was to take the hits so that everybody else could do the job. You know, you got to set up, you had to set up, you had to set up a blockade and, and stand there and be able to take all the shots. And that way everybody else can still experiment to do things. My, my, my best, my, my running joke is I said, it's amazing how many books that suck I was involved in, but I was never involved in anything good <laughs> during my time. <laughs> yes. It was all the creator and not, it's all the, in spite of you. <laughs> it all works as the creator, but it doesn't work. It's all, it's all, it's all the executive. So right. and actually, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize I was, I was that so be able to really concentrate just making bad things, but who knew? <laughs> Callum, thank you again for the Australian five dollars. Last rant: Why is Tom King still not fired? Everyone hates him, and that Jay Lee incident was just sick. Yeah, I didn't like uh, when he went out and took uh, Jay Lee uh, to task on Twitter trying to cancel Jay Lee. Uh, that was a couple years back. No, oh. uh, but Dan is Dan. Dan doesn't work at DC, so he can't. He yeah, can't I can't tell. Him. Yeah, that's a, that's a <laughs> there, but uh, but I do like Jay Lee. Jay, I you know I believe it or not, I actually wrote Phantom Stranger for a little while. You didn't see that, obviously, but I wrote Phantom Stranger for a little no. while. Yeah, I, 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 I'm the one who made it, brought in that whole Judas storyline in Phantom Stranger. Oh, cool. Yeah, and uh, so I had some beautiful Jay Lee covers. And before I worked in comics, I used to do publicity. And I actually, Jay Lee was one of the first people I interviewed for a ma magazine called Comic Book Week back in the 90s. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, I'm, <laughs> gonna, I'm gonna track down that Phantom Stranger. Incredibly talented. That's cool. And the trade paperback of that so, Phantom uh, Stranger. Is there, is there a, did they do trade my for the Phantom Stranger that you were Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, I okay, did it. Cool. And I, then I brought, I had to bring to Madison to help me because I was, my full-time job was in the way. Uh, but I, but I, I love, I, I, that's one of my favorite. I love all the really crazy corners of the DC universe. So yeah. when I was writing there, I did, I did, you know, naturally I did, I did Outsiders, I did OMAC, I did uh, Phantom Stranger, Challenges of the Unknown, uh, Forever People, and uh, and then uh, Created Sideways, cool. and then finished up on Metalman. Yeah, so I always tried to have a book going all times, but I didn't want to do it in, under the limelight. I just like to do it off in the corner, just to keep that creative energy going, because again, the, the administrative job can be so overwhelming and pull you away from the creative. This was one my one way to tether myself back into the uh, creative aspect of the DCU. That's really cool. Student of God for $2 says Frank should write for Ripaverse. Eric pays good. I think Frank uh, just does whatever he wants. Yeah, Frank, uh, Frank, Frank, works Frank. That's, you know, just, just <laughs> Frank works for that. I mean, Frank is possibly one of the most fiercely independent people that I know. Uh, he truly believes about the, the, the strength of the independent creator. Um, yeah. And uh, while he likes to support other people, he is he drives his creative vision top to bottom. And um, it's, it's kind of interesting to see. But it's, it's you know, you got to applaud him because it's, it's, it's worked well for him, you know? Would, is, would there be any possibility for me to get him on my show? Would, would that be possible? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> he can't help me. He can't help me with that guy. Yeah, we try. No, we try. Yeah, he's, he's got. He's got. A, he's got a crew. <laughs> Carbon Hart, thank you for the four ninety nine. Dan, do you think there's a chance that our beloved characters like Batman, Superman, will be saved from the SJWs? You know, every, everything. You know, look at the cycle of the characters. Look at the world. How many times? Where have we been over the years? You know, and look how many times the characters have changed. Look at how Dan deals this. with a question know, like that. He understands. Sylvester. Yeah, um, I was the guy. We put that together at the start. <laughs> that was, that's, oh my that's, gosh. So I just this just came out, by the way, guys. Um, it is Bat. If you want to talk about Batman, Batman the Joker Deadly Duo yeah. by uh, Mark Silvestri. This is so good. So no, buy this. <laughs> it took him about five years to make it. I would hope it's good. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, the arts and everything's incredible. Uh, listen, you know, yeah. Silvestri. You know, 
pound for pound, especially one of the, the, the best artists in the business. I mean, just absolutely, pure, you know, just pure style and form. And it's great that he's able to do it. It's just slow. And I mean, I'm not kidding. That, that took about five to seven years to make that. Five, five years, seven years, seven yeah. issues, guys. That's yeah, not yeah, bad. Yeah. Yeah. But it was worth it to me. So, yeah. Squibs one ninety nine. Any release date for the Sin City? Uh, Honestly, I'm hoping for first first quarter next year. Um, you know, please don't hold me to it. We're looking for March or April. Um, uh, it's just getting started right now. The the thing is that Frank got really just dove into Ronin and, and it absorbed all this time. And interestingly enough, I mean, we got through a lot and I was hoping that he was getting started on Sin City, but he actually started doing more art on Ronin. He actually drew the fourth issue. Um, mm -hmm. And he's, you know, and he wanted to do more and more work. And he does, he does full layouts for Philip Tan. It's not that Philip's, you know, working from just a script. Frank actually lays the physically the book out in pencil and ink. And Philip's working off of Frank's layout. So he's actually drawing every issue at the same time as Philip is. So it's, it's I issue. love Philip Tan's art too, just by itself. So, I mean, that's what a great combo. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I like, yeah. I, I've known Philip. Philip and I worked together on things like, um, on during Heroes, during the Heroes United, or we had Villain Story, Villain Story. Uh, we did Eclipso. Um, he did, he actually did um, uh, Forever People with me. He worked on Outsiders with me. I've known Philip a long time. I've always been a huge fan of his work, big supporter. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys for this. EVS loves Dan says, uh, uh, dumb old Vic for the four ninety nine. I'm unfamiliar with his work. We well, can get familiar with his work. Ancient enemies. Number six comes out tomorrow. My friend. Oh, I was going to say, no, uh, I said, I thought he did there you go. green lantern rebirth. Is that what he's talking about? No, <laughs> I'm unfamiliar. Oh yeah. You, you, that was all Dan. Dan. Dan did green lantern rebirth. That's all you. <laughs> we got to give you some credit for stuff, right? Um, if he's making grounds, maybe Micah Miller can give him an interview. Maybe build. I, I don't know that Dan needs to build up a little, but uh, Dan is he, you've been super just like going on yeah, every I, comic I, channel. I, I'm, 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 be, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm actually winding down. Um, okay. not, if, if it's, it's the complete opposite, I'm actually it, it's been interesting, you know, coming out of DC and then working with Frank. Um, you know, but uh, you know, it's to be perfectly honest, I'm, I'm I'm more about just doing things that interest me now and more about just you know, and that's why I was I appreciate you. Uh, having me on because I'm really here to talk. I'm, I'm excited that Ancient Enemy Six is wrapped up, and so I, you know, you're sitting in your. I hope. Now. <laughs> I hope that I got enough talk about Ancient because, like, I know what it no, is. No, no, it's I, it's I write, so I hope yeah. we're. Uh, I hope we're talking about this book enough because. Oh I know, no, no. Um, Like I said, I was. I was just happy to do yeah. it. Because it cool. There's so few. If you if you know the comics business right now, um, one of the things that's lacking is that uh, information ag uh, aggregate that pulls it together and hypes it and makes it interesting and lets people know what's going on and happening. There's a lot of great YouTube sites and websites and here are streaming on, you got all these things going on all over the place, but there's nothing driving the industry like the nineties did with wizard magazine right. or something that yes. was basically almost the taste for the industry. Most people are reacting. Yeah, to I just listen to Dan. I agree really with him out there about almost everything. Projecting excitement about things that are coming to be. And I, I, I think that's, that's one true. of the things that's been lost in comics is that sense of excitement. You know, everybody has been, um, really, really, um, I mean, it, it's gay, but like this guy was my leader in comics. You know, it's like I I still really if if I had like a sergeant or something like that uh, in the comic book industry, somebody who I, I look up to would be Dan. He's just right about everything, and he he's got a good positive attitude, uh, and he's just a great leader. And his loss when he talks about Wizard Magazine, like he sounds like me. Uh, we we kind of just agree about all this stuff. And uh, yeah, man, I, you know, when it comes to my time at DC Comics and in the mainstream, Dan DiDio was my leader. I, I still have a, a ton of respect for him. The audience in its own way. And, and in some ways, we're not that big a crowd to really be right. spread out okay. that wide. We got to find <laughs> Sorry. ways to pull ourselves together about True. things that really unite the business more I so than always press. say that. Man, that's yeah. refreshing to hear. Yeah. And, uh, and, and your enthusiasm is noted by Brian Rickard for 199. Thank you. He says, Metal Men was great. Your enthusiasm is incredible. And that it is. It's infectious, Dan. I, I mean, I'm like, I'm hyped to go to the comic shop tomorrow. I am. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I would. I, yeah. Comics are silly. They should be fun. We should argue about what we like about our characters and don't like. That's anybody. I'll, I'll engage in any argument about any character at any time. I love that shit because that's you what comics. Yeah, that's what cool. <laughs> I know, right? Careful what you wish for. Uh, but but uh, you know, it's. I've been doing that for years. I've been doing it before I started DC. I'm doing it now. No um, talking about and, diversity uh, you know, here. It's, it's identity politics. I, I like getting lost in those worlds and getting excited by what's happening in the books. And and you know, and, I, and I'll be honest, I don't I don't read as much as I used to. And then, you know, I did a lot. And now I, I can tell you the truth. I'm one of those, one of those older guys that's buying backwards, as I call it, you know, filling in collections more so than, than really seeing what's going on going forward. Every once in a while, something catches my attention. Uh, I hear about it. I go out and buy it. But for the most part, I'm not, I'm not, Pro, you know, prowling those shelves as much as I used to looking for something in, in, in a lot of senses, because mainly because a lot of stuff has been homogenized. So I can't even, yeah. I can't even tell what the titles don't even tell me what a book's about. The cover doesn't tell me what a book's about. I'm not even sure if the, you know, so I'm not even sure it's what it so is. It's so weird these days. Yeah. Yeah. And if somebody says yeah. to me, if you read these three trades, you'll get a sense of the story. I'm, I'm not ready to invest. He's not heavily. being you know, not the guy like, that this is how he is. Good. He's not, not this the isn't a performance. There by the third. This is just, you know, so. I have one last super chat, but I've got a question based on that then. So what, what are your five favorite 
or, or anywhere into that uh, runs or comics of all time. Then what? What? what uh, oh, God, that's so where, where do you go with this? Other you know, than Stephanie Brown Batgirl, which is the best. Yeah, you know, <laughs> my time, my, my time, my time at DC. My period of time, my sweet spot at DC is from Countdown to Infinite Crisis to the end of the Fifty Two Weekly Series. That's my sweet spot. That's that's yeah. that, that's my personal. That's the story I wanted to tell, and that was the one I could tell you I was most hands on about. Um, cool. During my tenure, so that's that. But for what I read, um, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a seventies guy. I hate to say, you know, so I was a big Engelhart, Gerber, you know, um, Thomas, or you know, uh, Conway uh, fan. You know, and I loved all those books. You know, Len Wein and Marvel. Cool. You know, I followed those are the writers I followed. I love the art on that. I mean, there's some incredible stuff. I'm, I'm just rereading this week um, John Byrne's Fantastic Four because uh, you know I forgot how good that was. You know, oh, amazing and, stuff. You yeah, know, and I, I forgot how, and how. How long he was on that series too? So I was just read. The, I just bought those two omnibuses. So I've been I've been going through those. Um, have a blast doing that. You know what I mean? Um, that's been a lot of fun. Um, and you know, every once in a while, I pick up something new if I hear uh, if I hear some rumblings about it, just to get a sense of that. Um, but you know, I, I like to, you know, I'm, I'm a traditionalist. I'm a superhero guy. You know, I mean, there's no denying that. You know, I, I was asked, you know, for Batman Day, somebody had me on and they asked me what was my favorite Batman run, and I, you know, and I had to go. I had to go. It's, it's Engelhart Rogers, man. Um, you know, that was that was mm -hmm. even though it was six seven mm -hmm. issues. That was that was a that was a big deal for me. That was really that interpretation of of uh, of uh, Batman that really just locked Joker in fish. my mind who that character should be, um, and that's something that I carried into the DCU when I went there. But you know, I, I you know I, I have a lot of fun, you know, and you know, and like I said it's just it's you know I I, I read a lot. This is one point two five you know, I, when I, I, moved, I moved from from California well, to, to, uh, to Tampa anyway. just recently, and um, and uh, I had to get rid of a lot of stuff. And I got I got rid of twenty six long boxes of comics. Oh, geez, that's a lot. But, but I still have fifty seven copies. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> fifty seven nice. long boxes. So I mean, I still got a lot of comics here, but that's in my cut to the bone collection. Just to let you know. <laughs> wow. And our yeah. final question from Dimo Z is going to take it way back for you. Thank you for the two dollars super chat. Yeah. Dan got stories from when you did Beast Machine. Machine. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, I, I joined Mainframe Entertainment when they were on Beast Wars, and I was part of the development for Beast Machines. Uh, so I had to bring in the writers and sit down with the people from. Uh, from Hasbro and Claster, and we had to hammer out that storyline. Um, and uh, it was interesting because I originally brought in Steve Gerber uh, to do it, but the people at uh, at Claster hated Steve, and they wouldn't let me work with them. So I brought in this other team, uh, guys uh, Eisenberg and Skier. They, they had worked on the uh, the Godzilla series um, mm. that ran for a little while. I, I forgot what channel it was on. I've been on WB, uh, but I but I brought them in, and they, they did a, they did a fabulous job. They they, they did a job. I I, I, I my days in animation are some of the ones I remember most fondly because I was in at the early days of computer animation for TV. There was no other shows on the air except what we were creating. So the idea of carving new territory and and having the in some ways the arrogance to believe this is going to be better than cell animation and try to convince people of that is where you know a lot of our drive came from. Um, and it's fun for me now. Here you're looking at this 30 years later, um, and now cell animation is the aberration and computer animation is everywhere. So everything that we thought was going to be true came true in the end. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. And of course, guys, make sure to show your appreciation for Dan by going to your comic shop tomorrow and picking up Ancient Enemies. Thank Frank you so much. Miller for sense. Thanks, this is exciting. Uh, and of course, I'll have a full review of the series probably up on the uh, the channel this weekend for you guys too. So, by the way, uh, I really just want to take it. note of one thing here. Uh, look how many views. 2,300 views for this interview. Uh, these SJWs can't get anywhere near these numbers on their channels at all. And this is largely going to be Comicsgate. Uh, Dan DiDio has been on other people's shows. He's been interviewed. Um, I've seen him be interviewed by other people. And they, they get like 15 people watching, and then they get like 100 views over time. This was a big deal. Uh, this probably actually sold some comics for Dan. Uh, and, you know, people are saying he comes across as likable. Uh, he's not coming across any which way. This is just how he is. He's truly a... Man, I you know you watch that, and uh, I my feelings about it are, I mean, almost like like um, like oh yeah, like that's oh yeah, that's what it was like. Uh, that's what it was like to care about you know working for a big company like DC. It's because there was a guy like that who you could believe in, who was a leader, who was um, charting the way, who had ideas, who seemed interested in what you were uh, interested in, who was trying to find a good opportunity for you. And, um, uh, you know, Dan was one of a kind and there just isn't, there isn't a Dan Didio. There isn't one. Uh, there isn't a Dan Didio anywhere else. And, you know, even he's coming across uh, on JDA show with all of that energy you can tell he still loves comics, but I think he's acknowledging. He says, I'm winding down. I think the truth is 
probably like the sales for this, his independent project with Frank Miller are not what they should be. And uh, yeah, I think he's sensing the, uh, you know, the writing on the wall in terms of comics. That's my guess, just based on that. He would never say that. He'd never say that. He would just be like, well, it's time for, you know, me to lay down. Um, but, um, you know, holy God, that was great. Uh, JDA, great job. Now, uh, JDA was rewarded for his uh, interview <clears throat> with Dan DiDio, a great interview in which Dan DiDio, I'm sure, had a great time. Uh, Dan DiDio was also rewarded the same way uh, by SJWs uh, like this dickhead, Jamal Igle, uh, who uh, is a dickhead. Look at that face. Jamal, brush your teeth. Could you please fucking like, brush your teeth, dude? It's just at least twice a day, maybe three times a day. Uh, rewarded with uh, Jamal Igle leading a cancel culture crusade against his former boss. And I think somebody who maybe he should consider a friend uh, or should at least have some respect for. Dan DiDio. Numerous comic professionals support artist Jamal Igle. <clears throat> who is always at the forefront of this. Jamal is such a piece of shit. And, I, you know, I don't say that lightly. Like, Jamal, you are such a piece of shit. It is unbelievable that in 2023, this is where you are right now. Ending his personal and business relationships with former DC publisher Dan DiDio. For doing uh, an interview with John uh, with John Delarose, artist Jamal Eigle, who worked on a number of DC titles such as Supergirl, The Ray Fires, from they're all forgettable shit. He did a passable and forgettable job on all of these books, where he just sat there. Jamal Eigle putting Jamal Eigle on a book like Firestorm, or on a book like Supergirl, or on a book like The Ray. Is like taking a shit on the streets of San Francisco. It's just going to lay there and stink because nobody's going to move it. That's all it is. Jamal's going to sit there. He's going to get his work done on time, and it's going to stink, and the editor is just going to leave it there because everybody's too lazy to do anything about it. That's all it's going to be. He would be on these books forever. They would just sort of... Ugh. Until somebody would come on. Oh, you know what? Let's kick Jamal Igle off of this book and put Gary Frank on it. Boom! Suddenly, to the uh, to the uh, moon, to the moon. And I don't say that like I don't mean to be mean, but seriously, that's how it was with Jamal, and everybody knew it. And you would just wonder, like, why? Why am I not popular? Is it because I'm black? No. Oh, God, no. It's because your stuff is really boring. Big ego, too. Uh, all right, so, uh, and he's receiving praise and support from a number of comic book professionals. They're all going to be the same ones. <laughs> JamalEigle.com. Like, look at his Supergirl, dude. Like, what the, like, you're not, what the hell is this? Do you see that flash on the table? What the hell? Let's just check something. You see that flash on the table there? Doesn't it look like this? <laughs> it's not it's not his, my art. It's his art. He copied my drawing. Hold on a second. 
you know, like when you're you're so familiar with your own uh work that like you see something, you go, is that mine? Like what the hell? And it's like uh this is mine. Like I drew this right here. This is my flash number nine cover, I think. I think that's what it was. Flash the fastest man alive. Is a series where Bart Allen becomes the Flash, like he ages and becomes the Flash. And then, like, uh, you go back here real quick and just look, and it's just like, I don't know, it's not an exact swipe, but it certainly does look like it. it. Certainly reminds me of me. That's interesting. Even the lightning bolt across the chest. Hold on a second. Let's take a let's take a closer look at this. Uh, this is mine, of course, right here. See the lightning across the, like, pfft, lightning bolt of electricity. And then you look, and I can't see, like, his perfectly well. I guess that what I could do is I could open it in a new tab. And I could sort of blow it up as big as I can possibly get it, just that one section. And go, uh, okay, so there's this right here. Got the arm out, this blah, 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 uh, versus mine, leg out, lightning. This arm would be out a little bit more in his. Wait a second, right here. This is my version. That's weird, right? I mean, am I just, am I hallucinating? Like, uh, or is it like pretty similar? <laughs> this is the thing about Jamal Eigel that I don't like. This is why I don't like Jamal. Jamal was a friend of mine. Uh, and uh, what he did was uh, I created Blackest Night with Jeff Johns. And I wasn't going to get to draw Blackest Night. DC said, we want you to bring back Barry Allen and do Flash Rebirth. So the word was out that I was going to be drawing Flash Rebirth. Jeff Johns was going to be writing it. And Jamal Eigel went and he did, he submitted. He did a, he did a tryout. He did a bunch of Flash pages to show Jeff Johns, hoping that he would get what was already my job. The dude tried out for my job. I have never. And by the way, like I was like, you know, a pretty big deal at that point. And the dude tried out for my job. I was just reminded of this recently because one of our, uh, uh, somebody uh, who knows both of us was like, didn't you like stop somebody at DC Comics from getting work? This douchebag. Like, seriously, like, he he auditioned for my job. It was my gig that I was taking because I wasn't doing Blackest Night. And as Jeff Johns is like, hey, you realize Jamal Eigel is sending me pages for Flash Rebirth? I'm like, what? what? He's like, yeah, he seems to be auditioning for the gig. It's like, he knows it's my job. Why would he do that? Jeff said, I don't know, man. I mean, I really like, first of all, like, you know, the, it's one thing like to be, to do that to somebody who, you know, you're friendly with, who you're friends with. It's another thing to think you can compete with me on one of DC's big event books. You cannot, my friend. There might be other people who could do that to me, but it ain't you. Jamal, it ain't you. Hey, uh, Gary Frank wants to come in and swipe my job out from under me. First of all, I'm going to go like this. Gary, sir, yes. And he could do it. But it ain't going to be Jamal Igel. Not in this universe. Not in this lifetime. Not that Stroons. Quoting the Sopranos. No. It ain't going to be you. It ain't going to be... Maybe I miss Jamal Mania. I don't remember Jamal Eigel Mania. I don't recall that. I don't recall Jamal Eigel being a superstar who could come in and take my job away from me. I was stunned by it then. I'm stunned by it even now, thinking about it. <laughs> my voice cracked. I know it did. Sorry. 
not good radio. Or is it? Maybe it is good radio. Yeah. Dale Keown. Dale Keown wants to come in and do uh, Flash Rebirth. Maybe he'd even get it done before me. I could understand. But it ain't going to be Jamal Igle. Not that chooch. Not in this universe. Not in this lifetime. Not in any of the 52 universes that Dan DiDio created. Even the cartoon one with Captain Carrot. It's not going to be Jamal Igle taking my gig. <laughs> I'll never forget that. That pissed me off. And that's when I decided maybe this guy's not my friend. So, uh, Jamal Igle, there he is. And uh, does he bear a grudge? Maybe he's mad at Dan DiDio because he didn't get to steal my job. I mean, I don't know. I never talked to him about it. I never said, are you mad at Dan DiDio because you didn't get to steal my job? Uh, Peter Armstrong says, it looks heavily inspired by your cover, but it doesn't look anywhere near as good as. Thank you, Peter. That's the correct answer. Not that Chooch. <laughs> yeah, Chooch is Italian American. It means jackass. Oh, it's a good word. Uh, all right. Dan DiDio did an interview with John Della Rose earlier this week to promote his Ancient Enemies comic book series. He also discussed his current gripes with the comic book industry, as well as explaining why woke ideology is rampant in comics. He did. He did do those things. Eigel reacted to DiDio doing that interview with John Della Rose by dehumanizing 50% of the United States of America. <clears throat> I just unfriended an ex-employer. That sounds like ex-employer unfriended you a long time ago, Jamal. Maybe it was back when you tried to steal Flash Rebirth from EVS behind his back. Maybe that's when you were unfriended. I don't know. I don't know. I, I was just shocked by the whole thing. I'm not saying I was involved in any way. I'm just saying I was stunned by that behavior. I just unfriended an ex-employer. Oh, no, not on Facebook. For crossing a line they can never come back from. Come back. Two different words. Nice compound word out of two words, stupid. Come back, not come back from. Once you cross that come escape line, we're done. Professionally and personally. Sounds like an encouraging uh, thing. Uh, let me see. Once you cross that line where you try to steal a gig from your friend behind his back. By the way, one of the biggest jobs in comics in 2007 or 2009, whenever it was. We're done, personally and professionally. Once you try to steal Flash Rebirth from Ethan Van Skyver, boldly, the ball's on you. You can never come back from that. In the comments section, Igo made it clear it had to do with Dio's appearance on Della Rosa's YouTube channel. This person says, I have no idea who JDA is. CG, are those losers still around? You're on Facebook, you fucking idiot. What do you mean, are we still around? Where, where's your MySpace page whining about what's going on in the rest of the real world? Have you heard of us? We're called Comicsgate. We're still around. Yes, we are. We're the only ones who are making a decent living in comics right now. Maybe you haven't heard because you're you exist on Facebook full time. You're on Facebook. What is it? 2006. IDW. Publishing group editor Heather Antos rejected. Uh, of course, she reacted to a uh, hundred, a hundred percent. Yeah, everybody, let's cancel Dan DiDio. Mark Russell, another one of these guys, completely understandable. Mamu, this is depressing. Dan DiDio gave you your start. 
You're a good artist. You're too good to be associating with the likes of Jamal Eigel, graphic policy founder, not this douchebag, Brett Schenker, responded by saying, who should I not cover support now? I don't know. Your kids. Mark Shane Blum. Good for you. It's tough to lose the business relationship. He doesn't have a business relationship with Dan DiDio, but it's worse to lose your self-respect. And I don't understand what these guys think is going to happen to their creative relationships when they get on the intolerance train. Choo, choo. And here's Steve Ellis. Can you DM me so I don't work with them? Steve. It's Dan DiDio, Steve. You're not going to be working with Dan DiDio. Newsflash, none of you people are going to get to work with Frank Miller, and it's because of this guy. You know what? If Dan DiDio were still at DC Comics right now, none of you cowards would be saying shit. None of you would be saying a goddamn thing. If Dan DiDio were still at DC Comics, where he belongs... All of you people who were basically exiled for having absolutely no talent, except for Mahmoud, who was good, would not be saying shit. You would be saying, um, how come, JDA, do you, like, can you put in a word for me? John Delarose, could you put in a good word for me with your new friend, Dan DiDio? Cowards, all of you, all these fake, all these fake demonstrations, all of this demonstrative, this fucking just show. We're putting on a show of pretending to just, Dan is over with Frank Miller and he's doing Frank Miller productions and he ain't associating with you guys. The books are closed. They ain't taking new members, Jamal. The books are closed. No new members. That's some true shit. Doesn't matter if you want to talk to Dan DiDio or not. He doesn't. He forgot you existed. I believe Dan DiDio once referred to you, Jamal, as street level. A street level artist. Do you remember that? Called you street level one time when you wanted to do a big book, which I think was Flash Rebirth. Based art department says, lol, I put your Lego study clip on Facebook and it got over a million views. Oh, I wish I got those views. My art page has 2.6 thousand followers who love any CG post I put up. My art and amateur comics get meh response. Facebook loves CG. Well, bring them over here. I want a million. I want a million views on these comics game videos we do. Thank you very much, Based Art. The books are closed, Jamal. They ain't taking new members, and that is some true shit right there. Books are closed. Dan is working with Frank Miller. He's working with Philip Tan. He's working with several other fantastic creators and Sven Gulli. He's got nothing for you. But I'm sure contempt, sorrow, not contempt, like pity. Pool's closed. The pool is closed. <laughs> Remember that? That was great. <laughs> Oh, geez. What are you going to do? And all because JDA did us a favor. He did the world a favor by interviewing Dan DiDio. Bringing light. Is this a rally against Jamal? Polls closed, Jamal. Sven Gulli. Yeah, Queen B likes Sven Gulli. The numbers don't lie, and they spell disaster for you, Jamal. <laughs> Jamal, he's not a friend of ours. No. Books books are closed. Come on. The books is closed. They ain't taking no new members. Come on. No, that's some true shit. The books are closed. Books are closed. It's a no-hitter, Jamal. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on. First of all, thank you guys for sending super chats. 
Uh, can we get a rip a temper tantrum out of you today? Says Evil One uh, for two dollars. A rip a temper tantrum. Oh, you mean me yelling like Rip it does? Did, wasn't that what that was? That just was pretty good. I thought the numbers equal zero, Jamal. Set out like you set out zero. Uh, let me see. EBS, if Rippa comes back to San Diego Comic Con next year, will you come out with the hangout with Eric July? Yes. Hell yeah, I would do that. Hang out with Eric July. Uh, I don't think my going to San Diego Comic Con is contingent on whether Eric July goes or not, though. By the way, I do have a pass uh, to go to uh, New York City Comic Con. Four day pass if I want to, uh, and uh, walk around there, maybe do some live streaming. Um, this is good news here. Here is uh, Mike Partika. My ice on number two commentary has begun. Come by and check out how many of these are there going to be, Mike. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> Oh my God, Mike! You're milking uh, Isom number two uh, more than uh, Dick and Vito are milking uh, Eric July. Free story, interior pages, opening sequence. Isom fans are already mad. Uh oh. All right, guys. Well, we got Matthew Fowler, who's actually come up with uh, a term. Matthew Fowler, of course, a detractor. Ripocrites assemble, he says. That's us. We're ripocrites. Uh, Ethan, I found that Jamal flash image. I think it might be a copy of yours. I got a feeling that Jamal's a bigger fan of mine than he ever let on. You know. All right. The ice on books are never closed for Mike, says Mike Jenkins. Yeah. Are we ready? Are we doing this? All right. So what happens? So last week, last week we were EFAPing uh, Nick Ricada and Eric July. They did a big live stream together, uh, which was uh, I I was probably the only person who EFAPed it live. Everybody EFAPed it the next day. I was there EFAPing it live, and it was a dreadful experience. <clears throat> dreadful experience. I, of course, am somebody who did a cover for ISOM number two, the best-selling cover. I don't care what Mike Partika says. Mike, shut up. My cover was the best-selling cover uh, for ISOM number two. So, obviously, I have a business relationship with Eric July, and that might mean that I'm biased. My business relationship with Eric July might imply that I'm biased towards Eric July, and you could take that however you want to. I don't really care. OK, a lot of people, some people have biases. Yes, you know, I'm on his payroll. All right. But even still, I disagree with Eric about certain things. And I have expressed those things. Uh, I'm somebody who will say, I don't agree with you about this. And he says, well, we can agree to disagree, uh, which to me, you know, is uh, a way of shutting down that conversation. Uh, but uh, anyway. Uh, I was horrified by this appearance. I found it to be dreadful. I think I vomited after it was over. I got a sickness in my tum tum. <laughs> Threw up in the toilet. Uh, is Eric July your partner? Yeah, he is. He's my partner. <laughs> uh, it's true. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I have a, a couple of things that I disagree with him about, but for the most part, uh, I'm uh, I'm here to uh, to say I like Eric July. His appearance on Nick Ricada's stream wasn't good, but uh, it ended, and then uh, I thought it was over with. I went to sleep, like I said, with a sick belly, felt nauseous. Could have been like the fact that I ate like a dozen donuts just before that. DoorDash is like, you know, it's gonna be the death of me. Oh, no, not your tum-tum, says Glitch. It's true. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a bad look for Eric. It was not good, dude. It was just not a good appearance. But I thought it was over, and it ended, and they shook hands, and it was, you know, it was like, hey, we had this conversation. We had it out. 
And uh, that's that. <clears throat> um, you know, we're friends, you know, so on and so forth. Nick Riccata, Eric July Pals. Next morning, this video shows up, which I have not watched yet because I was, you know, listen, I've been very busy. I'm working on a, I'm working on a couple of things. So I've not watched this yet, but I've heard about it. And I heard that this was not good. I heard that this did not portend good things. All right, so here we go. This is called uh, Moving Differently, Learning What's at Stake. How does he get this line here? Where is this line on my keyboard? Oh, I think I see it now. Moving Differently, Line, Learning What's at Stake. That's like uh, we got two different topics here within one seven-minute, 44-second video, which I have sped up uh, to, uh, oh, no, I haven't, to uh, one. 25. Here we go. Last nearly 20 years, but nothing obviously compares to the Riververse. Though I'm the same person, the situation is different, and many people will have trouble understanding that. Where does he go to make these? Who uh who's here? Caffeinated Wolf? Where does he go to get uh these blue video, the blue screen and everything? Does he have a blue light that he puts on? Uh hold on a second. What is this? You're way behind, bro. Like a week. What do you thought? This was from I'm not behind a week. I'm right on. I'm right on target with this. Oh, why am I behind? Uh, let me see. Learning what at stake says Eric E. Tank. No, he spelled it right. <clears throat> All right, here we go. It's a blue light and an SLR camera. Says Michael Beck. Can I get one of these? I got to give. Uh, I got to be able to make videos where I go. Hey, listen, uh, this week uh, there was some shit, but I'm here to clear it away. This week, Jamal Igel, that fucking chooch, he came out. He tried to cancel Dan DiDio. That's bullshit, obviously. Obviously. I would, do a, I would do a bunch of videos like that if I had a setup like this. I don't. I'm like ridiculous I, I like have this i have this camera here i got a camera here for filming me drawing and i've got my phone so i can do a pencil of scorn video even one says get a better camera but what like what where get a good camera for your stream please says spakel's doctor where what i would show me what to buy i don't know i don't know what to buy i'm not sure Yeah, it's called pontificating blue. That was the color. You're about, that's when you're about to pontificate. I am about to pontificate now. No, I'm going to allow Eric to pontificate. Squib says, you already have a blue tint to you. That's because of my new, uh, I'm reflecting Eric July and my new screen, which is a surround sound screen. Or it's a surround vision screen. It's really nice. Ask Kelsey. He's got a nice camera. I can't ask Kelsey because he quit. Where's Kelsey? He's not here. Buy a Razer Keo Pro. What is that? That sounds a Razer Keo Pro. Is that a real thing? Hmm. Ehef says, uh, uh, for $10, dick can be funny in small amounts. <laughs> That's what your girlfriend says. Sorry. He just doesn't uh, know when to stop or take responsibility for crossing the line. Have you read ISOM? What did you think? I read ISOM and I thought it was extraordinary, but <clears throat> not perfect. Uh, I did read ISOM. I've not read ISOM number two yet. Uh, and so I don't know 100% if ISOM two is better. Uh, but uh, all I can say is ISOM number two. Here's what I thought of it. It was a, a good read, but all criticism of it that I've seen from the people who are saying stuff about its story structure uh, seems valid to me. Seems like good criticism. We can't move forward if we're being protective of ourselves and our feelings over criticism. We can't move forward if we're just saying, well, most people like my story. Yeah, most people like your story, but let's move forward. Most of the people who bought it and, you know, I don't know how many people are reading these comics these days. I'm telling everybody, please read these comics. Ben31 UK says, Cyberfrog isn't perfect either. Yes, it is. Agree to disagree. It's perfect. Uh, Mr. Hatch says, uh, hey, Ethan, 
Thanks for twenty dollars, by the way. I love your videos so much. I'm releasing a comic soon. You've been an inspiration. When you crowdfund, how hard is it to fulfill? Well, you ask my backers. You print your own comics. Uh, also, can you see Cyberfrog turning into a movie? Uh, how hard is it to fulfill? Fulfillment is an, an enormous undertaking for people who have big campaigns. If uh, a small campaign is not that bad, you get somebody who you have 500 backers, you can do that yourself. That's not that hard. Uh, my campaigns have many thousands of people uh, and the each backer backs different things like they're different add-ons and combo packs. It is an incredible undertaking to fulfill one of these campaigns. It's also very expensive and people don't realize exactly what it costs to mail all of these things uh, and to buy the bubble wrap, the boxes, the crates that things are put in. It's all very expensive. It's not cheap. It's not cheap. So what well, people should know that. Do I print my own comics? No, I send them to comic book printers. Do I have relationships with? I have about three or four different choices of printers to go with, depending on what I want, what I need. And these uh, Chromium books that I do, there's only one printer in America who can do those. So I go to him. Uh, the uh, For anything else, I, I can I can shop around and I can see what uh, what it is that I'm looking for. Uh, also, can you see Cyberfrog turning into a movie? Uh, yes. My name is Heather Swain. Philadelphia has always been my home. Life was good until it happened. I'm friends with a cybernetic enhanced human-like frog created to save Earth. Nobody appreciated or understood him, but I did. We were good friends who enjoyed hanging out with a bucket from the chicken fry. Just me, Cyber Frog, and his very large brother, Salamandroid. Until the invasion hit. They rain from the sky. These space invader giant hornets attacked everyone, killing more than could stay alive, and covered the earth with giant blood honey hives. They can't fly near trees, so we hid in the woods, burning endless fires to keep them away, wearing red so they can't see and kill us all. Last time I saw Cyberfrog, he told me he'd track me down. But it's been decades, and there's been no sign of him. Yet I can't shake the feeling he is not gone. I believe he will return again. We need Cyberfrog and his brother Salamandroid to return and fight off these invaders. To take back our wrecked planet so we can live without fear. If you see my friend Cyber Frog, tell him I need him. We need him to save the world. Yeah, go back to uh, Cyberfrog 3, Red Extermination. The links are in the uh, description. And uh, back some toys, too. We're shipping those toys out. Uh, all right, let me see. Here's our July. Uh, moving differently, uh, learning what's at stake. I have no idea what this video is about. Certain aspects of my life, I have to move differently. And there's going to be challenges associated with that. 
in terms of the adjustment. Perhaps this will also give you some insight on what to expect should you have to experience the same thing. The big thing that changes everything is that I went from having a small circle of people that help produce content to now employing or contracting dozens of people. So anything that jeopardizes Jesus. the business potentially impacts the livelihoods of maybe over 50 people if you include the families. I'll give you an example. Recently, a deranged stalker that doesn't wash his clothes or his ass drove a Prius to one of our locations. He got that. Specific- See, that's that's the thing. You shouldn't you should be trying to defuse. And I, that's the whole thing. Like, it's like, I don't care. I'm not fighting these guys. This, this is them fighting me. You say stuff like that. You're, you're engaging them, Eric. Address I mean, it's funny. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just it, saying. And using someone else's screenshots, he did not get the location he appeared at in a copyright claim that was issued to him from us. He's just a crazy person that's trying to cause a scene and presenting it as a gag for crumbs of clout on the internet. This location is not our public address. It's not a storefront, nor does our side of the business part face a public. So this guy would say uh, that what happened was he made a parody account. I made a store. I made a parody. I got a guy uh, on uh, uh, Twitter who has a a parody uh, Twitter account called All Craps Comics or something like that. And uh, you know what I do about it? Nothing. I ignore it. That's what I do. Anybody who wants to make parodies of my stuff, I'm pretty loose about it. There's somebody else who's doing a, used to be a comic skater, is doing a pretty disgusting, uh, stupid uh, parody of Cyberfrog and me. Uh, there's a group of trans people who are doing shit, a comic book about me. You know what I do about it? Seto. It has nothing to do with me. It doesn't hurt me. It doesn't affect me in any real way. I don't think it affects my business. When you become big, people get jealous of you. And I don't just mean big like me. I just mean like when you become popular and people notice you, a certain amount of people who take a disliking to you. And, um, you know, uh, they're going to, some of them are going to be creative and they're going to make memes about you. They're going to make content. They're going to make whatever it is. Or make parodies about you, and some of them are going to really rub you the wrong way. They're going to be annoying, but you know what you should do about it? Nothing, <clears throat> absolutely nothing. You let them do their thing, and you just keep moving forward, making better stuff. Appeal to your fans. Don't give them the attention. Don't draw attention to these people. Just let them do what they want to do. Instead, somebody from Ripaverse uh, took this guy who had something called Clipaverse. And what did you do? You you uh, DMCA struck his little store and his little parody of, and now he's surprised. He's mad. Uh, so that's that's what this is all about. You you DMCA struck him. Apparently he had some parody merchandise or something like that, and now he's mad. That's that's who this guy is. He didn't just come out of nowhere. Uh, just let these people be. The last thing you want to do is take disgruntled people who are being creative about their disgruntledness and make them angrier. That's the last thing you want to do. That's my, again, we disagree about a couple of things. All right. There's only three ways to the front of our building, two of which are gated. The one that is not and it's easier to access is a one way and you'd have to turn around and go back the way you came to get out. That didn't stop a fat, unbathed man from appearing after hours and recording himself writing homosexual drawings, perhaps professing his love and desire to be a gay rabbit furry. He's You're asking for it. Dude, you're asking for it. What, what the hell? If you're worried about the safety of your employee, Eric! If you're worried about the safety of your employees as you profess, why are you doing this? Why are you making this video and saying these things to aggravate somebody who you feel is unhinged and you may need to protect yourself from? Or your armed guards might need it. Why would you do this? Guys, just like seriously, like uh I you know, stop it. God damn, I, I'm glad I didn't watch this video. I probably wouldn't have shown it. Stopped by a business nearby and they told us he smelled like literal shit. Buildings in this business park are not owned by the same person, but all those involved have made it clear that the weirdo isn't allowed back on that property. 
Now, some people would say it's just a funny gag. We should just laugh it off. Ha ha ha. It's just jokes, bro. And that's what I mean by moving differently. Granted, aside from driving by the property in a dirty Prius that he somehow got into during the business hours, he only drove by the front of the property. But it would be highly irresponsible for us not to do our due diligence. We have to treat it seriously enough as if it has the potential to escalate, whether it be from him or someone else. I don't expect drama farmers on the internet to understand that as they don't employ people to our degree. Of course, it's easy for an in sock account to think that we should just laugh it off. I guess it's only a coincidence that you choose to keep your place of employment and your own real name a secret. But should something hit the fan, had this, let's say, not been addressed or taken seriously, guess who must deal with the consequences? It won't be the general content creators or the law tubers or an in McSock account. It falls on me. That's my responsibility. And I take that very seriously. Do you take it seriously? You're antagonizing him. Holy shit. This isn't seriously. Seriously would be calling the police, uh, filing a police report, uh, telling people to stay on guard, not giving this guy attention or encouragement, and hoping this thing dies down and goes away. Uh, or, you know, meeting him at the gate with the police, telling him he's not supposed to be here. Jake Blue says uh, he didn't DMCA strike him. Uh, before you waste time going on going over this, you should probably watch the video where it just dropped. I got that lined up too. This isn't like self defense, guys. This is, I mean, this is like, you know, uh, man, dude. Stalker weirdos, they're weird, but I know how to handle myself. I carry wherever I go. It's not even about people finding out where our locations are. That was bound to happen, definitely with the internet. And there's a reason why we've long had armed security that's in the building. Anybody can be found, and that includes your own house. There's a difference between understanding that and driving your unbathed ass to states over filming, essentially saying, look, they work over there. The fat man did say he was coming back, but that doesn't even account for others that may do something weird. This is where my employees deserve the peace of mind to be able to do their jobs. I'm not even there. It is not unreasonable to expect people to have the decency to not appear in places of employment or their houses. In any other context, we... Now, hold on. Let me look at my chat here. Uh, let me see. Rooftop Koreans are posted. That's good news. Uh, let me see. Oh, God. Uh, I don't know. You trolled Donny Cates pretty hard, EBS. Yeah, Donny Cates is an, un an unhinged. He's not somebody that I'm afraid of, and he's not afraid of me. We're not like that. He's not an unhinged stalker. He's a, a peer uh, who uh, we had a question, uh, we had a disagreement about. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, let me see. I'd fight back as hard as I could, says George Bonney. This isn't this. I mean, yeah, in a way, I guess, but, uh, a uh, Doug 1985 says, Ethan, please tell Eric how crazy white people can get. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. They've done all of the assassinations in history pretty much. All right. Wong and Doug says, I told you it got worse. I, Jesus, God almighty. Calm down, Ethan. All right, I'm calm. I Listen, I didn't. I had no idea that's what this was going to be. <clears throat> hmm. Oh, yeah, Sirhan Sirhan was uh, Sirhan Sirhan. Not a white guy. All right, let's go consider it unhinged for someone to stalk drive several hundred miles and appear at someone's business that again is not some storefront if i'm at an event something like that i welcome anybody to come chat shake hands take pictures or whatever as long as it's respectful all is good and generally my public appearances are like that but that location is not an appropriate place and it's handled as such nobody's going to air you out for loitering drama queen but suspicious subjects will be treated as suspicious subjects and i get it some people will never get over the fact that young group of five nine is now a multi-million dollar business owner People that despise me always start from hating me and then they work backwards. So anything that they think they can do to me is justified because, oh, he had it coming. 
I don't expect to be given a benefit of the doubt by those types of people, nor would I walk on eggshells to try to appease them. I recently had a conversation with a law tuber where we talked about this. There was obvious disagreement, but apparently he thought that I shouldn't have said, for example, that if you bought multiple books to donate to comic books for kids during the campaign of ISOM 2, the cost was cheaper per book for the customer, even though we advertised that the price was less per book if you bought the bundles. There's literally nothing there, but I did get a chuckle out of him dramatizing it as if this was some groundbreaking information. Oh, no, you shouldn't have said that. Look, I'm sure somebody out there thinks that just because someone else. Here's the thing. You guys, uh, Ethan, you spent 30 minutes antagonizing Jamal Eigel. I'm not the one sitting here saying, Jamal Eigel, stop coming to my house. Stop threatening me. I'm worried for my family and the safety of my employees from Jamal Eigel. The difference here is pretty clear, subliteral. I'm not saying don't troll people. I'm saying that when your problem is there's a, a particularly undesirable troll who has crossed boundaries at this point, boundaries that pretty much we all agree with. I'm, you know, my my thing is, don't do this. Don't ever show up at somebody's place uh, uninvited and make yourself known that you're going to do some IRL shit. I'm not saying don't troll people. I'm not saying don't laugh at people and stuff like that. But I'm saying like, you know, there are certain people who you're like, I need this situation to stop because it could get dangerous. It's a difference. A little bit of a difference here. All right. My goodness. <laughs> Jamal Eagles outside my house right now and he hasn't bathed. Well, that's true. Yeah. All right is a lawyer and they suggested something there's an issue there it must be something and that's no disrespect to him as he very well could be genuine in his concern but part of moving differently is having lawyers mine are very good ones that actually practice drama queens make mountains out of molehills and there's nothing i can do to stop them they'll get the same results they got the first time if they think repeating factual information that was advertised is incriminating you'll get the same thing you got and that's jack shit. But you absolutely take precautions within reason when you employ people. I'm cognizant of my responsibilities as an employer, and that's something I take to heart. Again, I don't expect everyone to understand that as they do not do what I do. Concern, troll, or gaslight if you must, but I'm going to make sure I've done everything in my power to move in a way that ensures the safety of the people that depend on the Ripperverse or ensures it realistically to our, let's say, fullest capabilities. Sure, there are morons that think we started this company to own the libs, which is a retarded way to spend 300K, by the way. But one of the things I've always stated is that I saw economic problems that plagued the industry and I wanted to be a part of that solution. The people that work for this company, they wear it on their sleeves and they shout it from the mountaintop, be it creative or warehousing. They love to be here. Other people, yeah, they hate their jobs and they find it to be a soul burning, miserable experience. We don't have those problems here at the Ripperverse and I like to keep it that way. So don't project that evil on us. I understand that you can't possibly relate. Part of maintaining this culture, though, is being more aware of my actions and moving accordingly. I've had some humbling conversations with people I trust and I value on this very topic. I'll always be me, but it's no longer just Young Ripper 59 and its video editor. It's Eric July and a crew full of absolute fucking rock stars. Oh, and, and before I go, wash your ass. Up next for the Ripperverse this fall. <laughs> what the hell, dude? Uh... All right. Uh, what are you going to do? No, I mean, my thing is, uh, yeah, do not antagonize those people. Just don't do it. Let me read Super Chats. I know people are saying, read Super Chats. Everybody's got a great point here, I'm sure. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, Bobby Greer. Nobody does it better than EVS. Uh, agreed. You don't know anybody but your customers. Thank you. A uh, caution time trying to catch up uh, to where we are. Somebody show me the Jay Lee cover for the new Miller book that you guys are talking about that looks like Rack Planet. Um, let me see. It feels like I read most of these. Uh, EVS in slow motion jump tried to uh, EVS slow motion jump trying to stop that political book yeah it's true 
Narwhal says, Hotel Stories Live. I heard you promoted it. Thank you so much. Everyone back Cyberfrog to show support for E supporting me. Uh, hail E and happy and CG. Happy Sunday, says Eric Winberg. Um, let me see. I hope Tomlinson's book is as good as his stand up. Oh, here we go. These are new. Uh, Department of Comics with Agent DeCamp says, if Marvel offered you Fantastic Four, would you do it? I'd love to see your take on it. Boy, you know, it's funny because I was just thinking about that. Um, I was, uh, did you see that drawing of the thing holding a puppy? And the puppy was licking the thing's face and the thing was laughing and it didn't look right. I was thinking about doing like a video like to redraw the thing um, from that angle and just do it properly. And then I just thought about how much uh, I wanted to draw the Fantastic Four. But I, uh, you know, like just a one image of the Fantastic Four. I just don't have any time. Um, if Marvel offered me the Fantastic Four, would I do it? No, I would not do it. I'm, I draw cyber frog. I'm too busy. And they couldn't pay me what I make. I, I would never get back on that hamster wheel. I just wouldn't do it. Uh, Tom Tuttle says, a shorter headline, various street-level artists pat each other's backs. That is correct. Yeah, none of them were big names there. Uh, Jenko Morningstar says, hail, Ethan. Hello. Uh, I shit on you, 666. Thanks for $2. What is this? Who is this person? Uh, okay, I read that one. Thank you, uh, Peter Armstrong. I appreciate the uh, that super chat. Uh, and this one's good. Um, wow. Uh, JDA is allowed to be on CG. We said he could, says comic. Wait, is JDA allowed to be CG? We said he could, says comics exposed. <clears throat> I guess that's like disingenuous, but yeah, of course. Um, let me see. Dick can be funny in small amounts. I read this one. Mr. Hat. Thanks for, uh, oh, read that one too. Uh, Pilgrim Media says, yes, I'm pleased with your frankness. Who's you? That's Pilgrim Media. Well, thank you. Uh, Comics Exposed. I guess you missed Nick's six-hour-long Rumble stream after he spoke to Eric, uh, which included Dick Masterson. Rough stuff. Way too much drama. Seriously. No, I watched that. I saw that one. That was crazy. Yeah, but I didn't know what he was responding to. He was responding to that video when he made that video, and I didn't watch the Eric July video. So I didn't know why he was so mad. And then I, like I ended up yelling at the Eric July video too. Uh, Ethan, please. Okay, I read that one. Everyone involved in this seems retarded, says Yurash Matar. By the way, the word retarded is making a comeback. Everybody's using retarded now. Meredith G for $5. Um, you don't deal with narcissistic trolls by reacting emotionally. You engage in a no contact or a gray rock strategy while protecting yourself. Thank you, Meredith. That's all it is. You're giving them, you're giving them a lot of attention. You're going to expect more of the same from them when you do that. Uh, dumb old Vic says many parallels to Liam. Am I right? Uh, mm, no, not to Liam. Uh, but I will say that like that kind of strategy of like pushing back and not just being like the fuck away. And then just that's more like Patrick S. Tomlinson's strategy. I'm not saying Eric is like Patrick S. Tomlinson at all, but Patrick S. Tomlinson has a thing where like he has adopted some, the attention, uh, of some very, very smart trolls who don't give a fuck. Okay. And many of them are anonymous, but those who aren't don't care. <clears throat> There's nothing you can do. You can't shame them. You can't get them to go away. <clears throat> and Patrick's strategy is to engage them relentlessly and to try to beat them. And the thing is like, you have everything to lose. Like Patrick has a lot to lose and they have nothing to lose. And all they're doing is getting a laugh, uh, they're peaked and annoyed and vexed by him. They don't like him. They're getting a laugh. They're getting entertainment out of this. Whereas he's getting a lot of negative energy. He's getting, uh, there's some consequences. There are things to lose by continuing to engage with these trolls, but he won't stop because he, his pride won't let him stop. And that's the thing. And it has cost Patrick 
enormously and he has become a low cow on the internet because he continues to engage with them. And really what he should do is completely ignore them. Completely ignore them. Don't give them anything. Don't respond to them. Don't when they say don't feed the trolls. It's it's really the best advice. Ignore them as much as you can. Uh, Joe Frago says, uh, and hey, Joe, thanks for $20. He says, you've responded to psycho haters too. Sure. Remember screaming at Ape Rage Wiggle Wiggle on stream for making fun of Anna's sister dying? Yeah. Apparently not, since you've pushed his BS since and scolded Cecil for calling him out. Uh, yeah, I wasn't ever afraid of Wiggle Wiggle. Uh, I didn't like his behavior. I wasn't worried about Wiggle Wiggle. You understand? I wasn't worried about Wiggle Wiggle coming over here. I guess you really hate Wiggle Wiggle. If Wiggle Wiggle showed up in my driveway or Anna's driveway, uh, the last thing I would do is antagonize him and give him what he wanted. Instead, I treated him like a person and said, knock it the fuck off. Uh, Zorak says uh, these folks don't understand the long term. Ripa may be burning many roads just because some weirdo was weird this one time. Yeah, that's all. That's interesting. All right, let me look at the chat on this. I don't know. Can I do another Ripa video? Got another one. All right, let me see. And people were telling me I need to watch that one. <clears throat> I catch up with you guys. Mm -hmm. Wow, there's a lot of messages here. Uh, I see. Soy King EVS, you are a grifter too. I don't think I'm a grifter at all. Not at all. I mean, everything that I say. Uh, and, uh, I'm here to make comics and a product. I'm here to be on YouTube to promote that comic and the product. Uh, and I'm here to talk about what I think about things. I'm not grifting in any way. I don't care. I'll say what I want about whoever I want to say it about. So, uh, you're going to have to tell me where the grift is, my friend. Uh, let me see. Hail Ethan in chat. It gets weird when Ripa Gold posters in the chat room say EFAP the Nick Eric stuff saying the list is real. Bad optics. What? What is going on? I don't know what's going on here at all. Uh, action figure Atorium says, sounds like EVS might be the next Patrick S. Tomlinson. Uh, all right, let me see here. You think so? You think I'm the next Patrick S. Tomlinson? Uh, e griffs us with love and honesty. Yeah. Wondering Comics Gate King Marduk Knight says, hey, do me lol early. Wait, do me, do me lol early super chat. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, George Licker says, and you will face the repercussions of that. Okay. Uh, Yurash Matar says, people think of trolls as the fantasy monster, but trolls are actually fishermen of reactions out of the internet with trolling for fish. Kind of, yes. That is true. Drama is like crack for EVS. I do, I do like it, of course. And you do too. And stop lying. <clears throat> Listen. Oh, I like this word. Rip our cushions. No. Listen. I, guys, I can't. What am I going to do? I'm a person. I can't. I, I see this stuff. I got to respond to it. I got to say what I think. I'm not against Eric July in any way. I'm a friend of Eric July's. I help Eric July. But what am I going to do? Am I just going to say, like, nothing? I, I, This is not good. David L. says, do you have a Rumble account? What's the name? Uh, yeah, I do. I think it's Comic Artist Pro Secrets. <clears throat> I haven't used it yet. But Andrea asked me uh, today. She said, when are you going to get on Rumble? <clears throat> Yeah, EVS going to EVS. Uh, drama is real. Drama queens are not. George Licker says, oh, so it's a drama artist pro secrets now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Listen, if there's something going on on YouTube and it's interesting, 
I'm going to talk about it. All right, let's watch Eric's new video here. People said I should have watched this one first, but this one came second, so I don't know. Before we really get going, I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge the the elephant in the room because I know that there's super chats and uh, all of that. And I spoke about this publicly yesterday, and I don't have really anything to add, much like I said, but... There are people that know of this that don't follow me on Twitter and they hadn't maybe seen it. So I think it's it's, it's important that this video uh, exists because or me talking about this exists because, well, again, people are going to ask about it. Uh, and I do think it's important. So you guys may or may not know there were some things that were said uh, last night, right, um, uh, in a stream by Nick Ricada that was aimed at me. Uh, OK, huh. mm. and he the next morning, as indicated right here, uh, he's apologizing for losing his cool. Um, and he said right here, however, that, you know, I'd be justified in thinking he's an asshole, took things to a stupid level. I want to be very, very clear. And this is what it is that I said. I have no intentions on going there uh, with with him. Um, and that's just not going to happen. I'm not going to go after him uh, or, or or any of that. I did reach out to him uh, and, and, you know, privately about that. And once I got wind of it and there were some other things that I saw that happened after the fact that were part of that same stream. But I did end up texting him. And he acknowledged the reason I'm bringing that up is because uh, I, I did say that. And he, of course, acknowledged that I reached out to him first um, and we uh, will let him calm down. Uh, and at some point we're going to have our conversation. OK, uh, and I, that's why I'm not going to address the things it is that he said uh, in there i will address that i get it as been and that's another the reason why this exists because i uh, people are sending me videos and clips and all this i understand that i've already seen it trust me i'm not gonna address that stuff publicly i will d address it directly with him and look everything it is that i do Believe it or not, and there's some people that are just going to think that because they operate on a different wavelength, this is not how I operate. However, I have an ultimate end game here. OK, uh, uh, the, the river verse is part of that. And I, there, there's a vision that I have for the world. Right. And I want to be a part of that solution. So be it the things that I see and identify economically, people that have been following me over the years. That's all a part of it, whether it, how I use my band, all of that is is part of of that ultimate end game and in understanding that you can call people cool i also that. understand strategy okay and for me it is abund abundantly clear that be it with nick uh it's not conducive any event that i respond or i acknowledge something even if i disagree with it even if i find it to be off-putting or incorrect um i've done it in the past, because I value what it, my end game is, and I understand that between the audience reaction and all of that, uh, with with my folks going after him or any of that, because I understand strategy, to me, it is not worth it to continue on with that. And for me, I will take a step back in the sense that look, I get it when you value someone else over let's say myself in this case it's an expectation and it's i might find it bizarre and i i, I don't agree with with acting as such but it's an expectation that i am to be the one that absorbs everything right if if something's levied at me it's i should ignore it it's well this person has good intentions it's this person may agree with you it's all of that they are able to levy things at me in the event that I respond and address them. Then it's I'm an ego. I'm a, uh, th these people might think I, I have ego. Uh, he can't take criticism. It's all these other things. So I'm expected to absorb it. But when it comes specifically to Nick, like I've said, there's other things that I value there. And I don't think with someone that has kind of a, a blend of audiences, especially, I don't think it's conducive for me to have a spout there publicly and I don't want any part of that. So that's why for me moving forward, when it comes to him, I'm not saying that he he uh, he uh he's going to change uh, uh his approach. I'm not I'm not. That's not what it is that I'm saying. I just 
If I even disagree with whatever, I'm good. I'm not saying anything about it. We'll have our conversations uh, uh, privately. We'll address this stuff. We'll air our grievances. And look, I don't want anybody to come out of that. I'll be honest with you. I don't want anybody to come out of that thinking that, well, this means that, uh, you know, it, so it, it's going to go one way or the other. Like it's going to be one of those things where it's like, hey, go on separate ways, we, whatever, or we're buddy, buddy. I don't want you to be under that impression because that's not that's not the the intention. What I want out of this is for us to get beyond this G.H.E.Y. gay shit. And at least there's no kind of public continuation of animosity. And I won't be a part of that. That's what I want. What happens out of that and how others feel about it don't really uh, th that's not of my concern. It's just that as long as at least we can say, you know what, these are the issues. We talk about those privately air it out like men and then move forward. There's no issues. That's all I care about. And that's going to be my approach. Right. So uh, I get it. I've seen everything. I understand that there are things that have been said that you'd maybe find uh, indefensible. And I'm not saying that I didn't see it. Right. I'm All I'm saying is I'm not going to address that stuff publicly. I will address it directly with him. I will resolve it, hopefully, uh, directly with him and we'll be good. But either way, no matter what happens out of that conversation going forward, he if, if I find something definitely particularly with that with, with him and I maybe disagree with. The uh, let me see. Ask John Byrne to do a cyber frog Raj 2000 variant cover. Dude, I would love to get John Byrne to do a cyber frog variant cover. That would be a dream come true. John Byrne, my favorite artist, I think um, of all time. Uh, my my, you know, top five would be John Byrne. Dale Keown, Todd McFarlane, Bernie Wrightson, Brian Boland. Those are my top five. John Byrne's got to be the, the top of that because I think he really made me love comics. Uh, I loved John Byrne's work. It was so much better than everyone else's. <clears throat> uh, so I would love that. Uh, let me see. Uh, Ethan is absorbing all of this gay, gay spelled G-H-E-Y, chaos and becoming fatter. Uh, hold on a second. EVS is like Ripa can't take criticism. Yes, I can. Of course I can. I, I take criticism very well. Right? Uh, don't you think so? Or do, do you disagree? You, what? Stop criticizing the way I take criticism. It's fucking bullshit. With an approach or, or something I was said about me, I have nothing to say publicly and I'm not at least going to be the one that's participating in that. So I think that it's important to acknowledge that. Wow, that was a hard closeout. IDW Publishing lost $1.28 million. And then thing. we're into IDW. Okay, so that's uh, so that was in response. So Nick saw the video that I showed you before and went on a six-hour tear on Rumble with Dick Masterson. And he took the video down, but <clears throat> it was... Uh, uh, it was extraordinary. It was uh, a lot of uh, Nick kind of unloading on Ripa. Uh, and I think he regrets it. In fact, I know he does. So, uh, you know, he said he was taking the video down. Uh, all right, let me see here. Uh, appreciate you guys. Thank you for putting up with uh, this silliness. Uh, we got a super chat from uh, Wisdom of Zayas. Eric literally challenged detractors to pull up. Somebody took his challenge and pulled up. And Eric immediately whines and cries like a, and then all caps, beta, probably like that guy. What's his name? <clears throat> Who does that uh, Fallen State uh, show? What's that guy's name? Uh, Who does Fallen State? Uh, did Nick lose? I want to watch the whole thing. It, I think he took it down, but I think it's like uh, other people took it and they, they took it apart and made like little short videos of it. Uh, it is vulgar. I watched the entire thing like this. Uh, I, I, this fight is not fun. Uh, I mean, it's interesting as hell. Drama is interesting. Fight is not fun. I'm not happy about any of it. I've got my point of view about uh, how everybody should be behaving. And... Uh, you know, I'm not taking anyone's side here, but uh, holy cow, you know, let's, uh, I don't think anyone's helping themselves. I don't think anyone's doing themselves any favor, and I mean anyone. 
Jesse Lee Peterson. I love that guy. Absolutely love it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're all on the same side here, I think. I hope so. Uh, that's how I uh, all same EBS after Dick joined it got insane. Yeah, it was really interesting. I mean, if you want to watch it, uh, if you if you do watch it, it is uh, it is good. It is good. listen. Nick Ricada knows how to talk and he knows how to say things in a pointed and bright way. He is Nick Ricada for a reason. He's a very very sharp fellow. Uh, let me see here. I'll answer you guys' questions now. Do you love black people? Uh, I love people, but do you love black people? I love all people, but do you love black people? I mean, I said I love all people, so that includes, like, that would include white and brown and black and Asian people, but do you love black people? Yeah, okay. I love black people. All right, Jesse? Are you happy now? That's uh, Jesse Lee Peters' <laughs> sign of interrogation, and people always amazing. And people always go the same way with it. It's hilarious. I love that guy. Uh, <clears throat> all right, let me see. Do you love TJ? Uh, Mike Partika says, watching the biggest problem in the universe is like watching two cows caw at, oh, crows caw at each other. Do you think so? Uh, let me see. You said Anna is smart, Ethan, says Woden Shot. Uh, Anna is smart. You know, she is above average intelligence. She is. She's not stupid. She knows what she's doing. She's not as smart as, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of like who would be smarter than Anna. Oh yeah. Every man. Yeah. But she's like smart for a girl, you know, uh, Nate 313 goes, I hate all people. Thank you. See, that would be a better way to answer that whole question there. Uh, <laughs> do you love black people? No, I hate all people. Well, wait a second. Do you love black people? No. Uh, so that's the thing. Uh, Anna was smarter than Leem. Uh, she is the smartest girl who ever ate dirt. <laughs> Anna's retarded and eats dirt. Well, every now and then she says something like this, 11-9. 9-11 happened in November. Mandy is smarter, so is Computer Man. Yeah, I don't know. I'd like to have both of them take an IQ test and see how that goes. I'm not really sure. They're both they're both bright. You're not talking to dumb people when you're talking to Mandy and Anna. They're both. I mean, you know what I mean. Like I've you've I've spoken to dumb people. Like you know, uh, that's not Anna. That's not Mandy. Neither of those people are dumb. Mandy is smarter. Says uh, fallen low. How? What's your name mean? Fallen low life. Fallen low low life. Is that what it is? Fallen low life. Hmm. Mandy's very smart, despite the accent. Just another guy says that Anna is smarter. She tricked the guy. To <laughs> she tricked the guy to marry her. Rini. Okay, so who's smarter, Rini? Oh, I want to ask this question of the of the entire panel. <clears throat> this is one of those things where we got to do a poll. Hold on a second here. We got to do a poll here. Uh, this is a really good question. Who is the smartest out of the following? Okay. Anna, uh, Mandy, and then add option, Rini, and there we go. I think the, those are all the women that I'd like to know about. And we'll see how that turns out. You guys make sure to vote for one that you think is the smartest out of all of those. Uh, begun the IQ wars have, says Barbful. Yeah. Luffiest guy says, stop talking to yourself. I'm. I, what do you mean? I'm doing a live stream. <clears throat> Theoretically, I'm talking to you guys. Sometimes I wonder if Luffy is God actually loves me. It doesn't feel like it. I don't feel love coming from Luffy is God. Uh... I said RRR was dumber than Anna, and everybody and their mama lost their shit, including Top Simp Cecil. Oh, Matt, can you get along with people? My IQ is 130, they said, but people think I'm retarded, says Matt Matt. 
Yeah, I know what my IQ is. It ain't nothing to write home about. But <clears throat> uh, I know when I'm talking to somebody dumber than me, and I also know when I'm talking to someone way smarter than me. Uh, so that makes me pretty smart. Uh, you know, my IQ is like, uh, I think it's like above average. But uh, yeah, it's like I've I've spoken to people that I'm like, wow, this person's way smarter than me. And there are a lot of people on the internet who do live streams that are smarter than me. I didn't come here to love you, Ethan, says Evil One. <clears throat> well, what did you come here for? To bury me? Joe Dogs here. He says, Roy Thomas is one of my top 10 comic artists based on my favorite Marvel team, The Defenders. Uh, I think Roy Thomas is a writer, Joe Dog. I don't think he drew anything, but he may have. Did Roy Thomas ever draw anything? Paul Taylor says 100 is average. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm way above average then. 100 is average. My IQ is way above average. It's like 75 or 76, says Cyber Chud 2077. Robert Romano is smart too, says Michael Bancroft. Yeah, that guy is smart. Uh, EVS's IQ is 136. It's been tested, says Scott X. Uh, 130 is genius, right on the edge. Hmm. My IQ is not 136, I don't believe. My my mom told me what it is. My mom told me what it is. This is a weird thing. Like, <clears throat> my sister Jenna was getting great, like, A pluses. She was getting great grades, and I was not getting good grades. And one day, my mom told us both what our IQs were. And she said, you know, your IQ, Ethan, is one point higher than Jenna's. And uh, I remember her saying that and me thinking, huh, that's interesting. My IQ is higher than Jenna's. Why am I so stupid then? Because Jenna's getting like A's. I wonder why I'm dumb. And I thought about that most of my life. You know, like, why am I so stupid when like other people who uh, have tested one point lower than me in IQ tests? are getting A's. I wonder why. Well, my sister told me, last time I saw Jenna, it was great. Jenna came to the house. This was this year. And we were having a nice talk, you know, about family and stuff. And she remembered that conversation. And she took it really personally. She thought my mom was saying that Ethan is better than you. Your brother's smarter than you. I like him better. I said, Jenna, no, that's not what she was saying. She was saying... Like, uh, I, there's no reason for me to suck as bad as I do because you are doing excellent and I have a, a one point IQ advantage. You've been carrying that around with you that mom thought you weren't as good as me like this long. Wow. That's strange. Like you never know how people are going to receive things. Steve Turney says, finally caught a stream live. I was like, no, mom, mom, absolutely. Mom didn't like me. No, she absolutely loved you. She was confounded by what a slob I was because I've been given so much like you know today like you know I really am gifted and amazing like I sat down at the piano today behind me and I just started playing you know I started playing a song I heard the song in my head and uh, I was like I wonder how it goes and I could instantly play it And uh, that, that's like, I mean, it's not, it's not super talented, but it's pretty talented. It's, a, it's evident of a pretty high IQ. I just sat down like, she's just 16 years old. Leave her alone, they say. But I want you to know. Ask Andrew. She'll tell you. She's like, why are you playing that song about being a pedophile? I was like, uh, I don't know. It's just in my head today. Yeah. <laughs> Ethan's ego is going wild again. It's never stopped. Uh, Alfred Ortiz says the IQ story was actually depressing. Yeah, like it made me sad when she, because I remember the incident clearly and I remember what I was supposed to have taken from it. But it was shocking like that, like Jenna had taken something completely different from it and took it to heart and carried it around with her like a wound for 
30 years. And I was the one to have to tell her, that's not what mom meant, Jenna. That's why I'm smarter than you. I know what mom meant. You're stupider than me. You didn't know what she meant. That's why, uh, that's what IQ is all about. So I'm here to make you feel better about it. Uh, JJ says, ask your sister to say what years the following wars happened. Oh, women in wars, revolutionary civil, World War I, World War II, Vietnam. Make her give a year range for each one. Yeah, women don't know history, most women. And they don't care about wars. Like, I think Jenna would know some of that. Uh, Twig says, uh, Iris be more smarter than you is be. Thank you. Yeah. Peter Rock of the 70s. Alfred says, because your mom was lying to you to make you feel better. Oh, you think so? Well, it didn't work because I didn't feel any different. And uh, she made Jenna feel worse. So I guess my mom has a lower IQ than both of us. <clears throat> but yeah, like I, you know, IQ is just, it's about understanding things. It's about taking in, uh, you know, interpreting facts and information, knowledge. Uh, Zia is smart, so Brian uh, 999. I don't know about that. I'm not so sure if that's the case. All right, so we're looking at the poll now, and the poll says that Rini, runaway Rini, is the smartest. Mandy, she, Rini has 62%, 425 votes. That's a pretty good poll, right? That's a pretty good sample. 62% uh, for Rini, 21% for Mandy as a uh, second place. And Anna is the dumbest uh, with 17%. So pretty much everybody agrees uh, that Anna is the stupidest of all the women in Comicsgate. Uh, and the Rini is, like everyone agrees, the Rini is the smartest. Anna can't even read, says. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, Mandy and Anna are super smart, says F. And that's not what you guys said. I have no opinion about it. You guys, uh, you know, to me, they're all they're all geniuses. But you know what? Like, you know, uh, there's a certain amount of IQ in being able to draw. And uh, Anna would get lost in a bathroom, says Doug, 1985. And Rini is a really good artist. So, uh, yeah. You think Rini's on the spectrum? Maybe. Acrophis says, uh, think about it like exercise. If you want to get stronger, you work out. Uh, if you want to get smarter, learn. Yeah, educate yourself. And do your best to educate yourself. Uh, Leah Dara is here. Hello, Leah Dara. Uh, Mike Partika says, being in Mensa, and Mike Partika probably is very smart, but... Uh, I don't know how smart it is to obsess over ISOM, but he says, being in Mensa and encountering a lot of high IQ people convinced me that the only real benefit of being among the high IQ people is that you'll they'll almost always get your jokes right away without explanation. We're all laughing at you, Mike. Don't worry. <laughs> Mike, we all get your joke. Uh, you know who else was smart? Fredo. Just saying. Says, well, we're at comics. Uh, yeah, I'm smart. <clears throat> so who was smartest out of all the brothers? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, Michael was the smartest, right? Highest IQ. Fredo might have been number two. Sonny was not smart. Sonny was all emotion, all anger, all fire. You know, that's the thing. Like Fredo was, uh, <laughs> yeah, probably smart. I don't know, Mike. I don't know how smart you are because... Uh, you know, you have said, like, if you were smart, Mike, uh, you would recognize that most of the things that you're talking about are meaningless, like pointing out odd discrepancies does not make you smart. It makes you kind of a, like an autistic retard, you know, that's all. It doesn't necessarily make it smart that you recognized something and focused obsessively on it. Uh, something that nobody else cares about. Like smart people would go, yeah, well, there's the human factor. Human error is a factor. So we dismiss most of this. You see what I'm saying? Alfonso Lopez says, hey, Ethan, hope the family uh, is doing great. Uh, hope to see Rainbow the Brood soon. Uh, can one day create a character like Hal Jordan? 
Uh, he is the best. Take care. I like to do that. Thank you very much, Alfonso. I appreciate you. You know what I'm saying, Mike? I want to see if Mike responds to that theory of mine. That's my mid-range IQ opinion of things. Uh, <laughs> Mike is the dumbest Mike in CG. Mike just said he was in Mensa. So I don't think he's that dumb. You have to be a genius uh, level IQ to be in Mensa. You know, but there's also, I mean, there's some practicality. There's like a little bit of street knowledge and just recognizing, uh, sort of prioritizing things, uh, in terms of importance, like what is important, what is actually important. And that takes some IQ. Did I chase Mike away? God damn it. Uh, David Ellis for $5 says, are you going to sell the damage figures for a bit less so we can buy openers? Um, yeah, like uh, I will. I mean, we, you know, uh, whenever we find anything that is not, that is imperfect, whenever we find it, by the way, if you receive something that's imperfect, please let us know so we can replace it for you. But whenever we catch an imperfect product, we put it aside in the dinged and dented area of the warehouse. And uh, the plan is, of course, to sell it all. Like, I'm like, we, we'll still make a profit on it, you know. For what we paid for the toys, we could sell them for half price and still make a profit. Not a good profit, but a profit. So uh, don't throw anything away. Somebody will want it. Put it aside. Uh, so, yeah, we will sell damaged figures. The plan is really to do, um, uh, you know, a big Christmas sale uh, where you can get uh, clothing you can get uh, Rec Planet, you can get posters, and you can get toys. We, I mean, cr our Christmas at All Caps Comics, we're set. We have so much product, it's really terrific. Uh, Gormley has a 3,000 IQ. I kind of believe it. Mike Partik is here. He didn't run away. He said, nah, you need to watch my latest Dyson 2 video. I'm very, really proud of it. Maybe you can e-fap it, point out uh, what you think are good and bad critiques. Uh, I gave you a dumb voice, Mike. <laughs> That's not what you sound like at all. Uh, maybe we will. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to focus on ice on it. has very little to do. He says, I responded. has very little to do with what I'm doing. <clears throat> you know, when, when ice on or Eric July or rip averse is the focus of attention, we'll talk about it here, but it's just, it's not all caps comics. Uh, here's our friend caffeinated wolf. You can have a high IQ and be knowledgeable in some things, but lack street smarts or other forms of applicable knowledge and wisdom. 100% correct. Yeah. And that's like autism, really. You know, Diana Rigg was in Mensa. Yeah. <laughs> you don't see Mike bragging about his Nambla membership. Douglas. Douglas Dauntless. He's not in Nambla. It's ridiculous. We don't call people pedophiles here. I've seen other people. We don't do that. We don't call people pedophile. It's the worst thing imaginable. Not unless they are pedophiles. And Cecil's trying to sell their Green Lantern comics. Like there was a guy who, uh, and we talked about this, a whole video where Cecil's selling comic books from the early 1990s written by a convicted child pornographer pedophile. And I realized he uh, was trying to sell the comics, but I just thought people should know. I mean, it's an interesting fact that the guy who wrote them went to jail for having uh, something like 600 images of child pornography, some of which he generated himself uh, on his computer. And uh, when I told people that, like, Cecil wasn't able to, unfortunately, Cecil was not able to sell any of those comics. Uh, Evil One says, so your IQ is 404, Pi Man? No, I'll just tell you, my IQ is 126. 126. Or, or is it 127 and Jenna's is 126? That sounds more likely. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's 127. Which is, you know, uh, good. You know, it's good enough to hang out with some smart people. It's good enough to be able to solve problems. I'm very good at creative problem solving. Mike Partika says, you you just talked about Ripoverse for a whole hour. Because it was relevant. <laughs> I mean, that's why. Yeah, we don't talk about it all the time. We talk about it because right now there's a whole big thing going on and it's trending on Twitter. Ripoverse, Nick Ricada, Isom, Eric July have been trending on Twitter now for 48 hours straight. 
David also says, I ordered hats. When are they coming in? David, I think the reason why your hat order is held up is because you're waiting on Malin's uh, book attached to it. But honestly, I don't know why we're doing that because I can't ship a comic book. I can't ship a comic book and hats in the same box. I can't do it. It doesn't make sense. What well, makes more sense is just to ship out all the hats and then just make a mark on it that says, we're, you know, we'll ship you the comic book when it's in. So don't worry. We'll send you your hats. <laughs> uh, my last IQ calculated is 167. Yeah. Ethan's IQ is 364. No, that's his weight. Sven says, I tried, I tested 127. Yeah, I think I'm the same way. <clears throat> my mom told me, and I said, that's not as high as I wanted it to be, but it's still pretty high. Uh, Peter Armstrong says, I just beat you on 128. Yeah, I don't feel like that smart of a guy, but uh, I, you know, here's the thing. Part of being pretty smart is thinking you're not very smart. It's like part of being intelligent is knowing that you're not that intelligent, you know? Because you recognize intelligence in others. You recognize superior intelligence in others. Dumb people don't do that. Dumb people, when you see people going, everyone's retarded. Everyone's retarded. Uh, that person is retarded. They're, when you underestimate, chronically underestimate everybody else's intelligence all the time, it's because you have a low IQ. Almost certainly. Smart people know how to, as Eric July would say, peep game. Uh, in others. Peeping game means to recognize the skills in other people, uh, I believe. I don't speak Tupac Shakur fluently, but I'm pretty sure that's what peep game means. You recognize uh, skills in other people. Based Art Department says, uh, recommend any good art or storybooks, videos, or advice for amateur comic book creators or hopefuls. I've been working many hours to as possible to improve. Well, can I just tell you, I think you should subscribe to David Finch, uh, Dave Finch's YouTube channel. I really think he's good. So you want to be a, you want to be an artist? Yeah, I think he's great. I don't know where to go to read books about how to write stories. I don't, I don't know how to do that. I never read a book about how to write story. It's a failing of mine. I, I'd like to read one. But yeah, there are uh, you know there are plenty of channels here on YouTube where people teach you how to uh, teach you some technique. Uh, Tommy Svensson says, Ethan, have you taken a Mensa test? I don't think so, or just an IQ test written by a random person online. Oh, it wasn't online. The IQ test I took was in school, uh, and uh, it was I think in like the eighth or ninth grade. <clears throat> so uh, I don't think IQ changes. I could be wrong, but I don't think it really changes. You don't get smarter or dumber, I guess, unless you have a head injury. But I've never taken a Mensa test. I took an IQ test, and uh, I actually, I took a bunch of tests in, like, the sixth grade, and they put me in gifted and talented, uh, which just goes to show you how dumb everybody in Merchantville is if I was picked out up from among them and uh, assigned designated gifted and talented. <clears throat> but I told you, I've told you the story before of how I won that life serial commercial contest by going off on my own. And that really defined my whole life, man. I just don't listen to, I'm not a joiner. I, I don't need to be a part of a group, but you know, I'm not into group think. I have learned <clears throat> through my own experience that going off on my own and betting on myself pays off and not betting on other people. I bet on myself. I barely passed my IQ test. I got a 66, says Rashmatara. <clears throat> Thanks for $2. That's funny. If you had a 66 IQ, you'd just be laying there. <clears throat> yeah. Finch is outstanding. I agree. Uh, David L says, no problem. Uh, just curious. I do want my honeycomb box. Yeah, David. Uh, yeah. Thanks for uh, the live stream, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Wonder CG King Marduk Knight says that's how serial killers get caught. Dumb smart. Serial killers are usually pretty smart. 
Uh, gifted does not necessarily mean you're smart, Ethan. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> that was my point. Like, but I was given all these tests where, like, I, I, I don't know. They established that I was gifted, and everybody else said, uh, "Why?" Like, I remember like going to gifted, uh, talented, which was a class that took place like third period or something like that, and all the other students knowing that I was there and being like, "Why? He's an idiot." <laughs> why? <laughs> They said, why is Ethan, uh, hold on a second, EBS is lying, Joseph Smith is, I, I would never let Joseph Smith down, first prophet of the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's the truth, it's the God, God's honest truth. Yeah, they were like, uh, why is Ethan there? He's fucking stupid. Like, they probably would have called me retarded. Uh... Yeah, they're just like, they thought it was about like just uh, getting good grades and stuff, I think. That was the general impression. And I didn't do that. Uh, Ethan went to the same uh, school for gifted as Liam, <laughs> as Liam Gray. Yeah, we were both in Jersey together at the same time. Manoho says, Kip Winger is still singing 17, not very smart. <laughs> Paul McCartney is still singing. I saw her standing there. Actually, I don't think he is. I think he took uh, any master's and says, I wasn't gifted and talented, but was disruptive. Did they kick you out because you were disruptive? You just scored higher on the breathalyzer, says Douglas Dauntless. Oh, I could use a drink or two tonight. It's only 6 o'clock. It feels like much later. I'm going to go back to drawing. I told Andrew, I said, I'm going to be live streaming today. So I got it. Like, I did nothing. You know what my YouTube channel earned last month? Not a lot. That's what I get. YouTube is my pocket money. Like it's, you know, it's my money. It's the money that I get to keep. I, I got to do live streams. Uh, and I did barely anything. I didn't make, I made a few videos, but I didn't do any live streams. I didn't show up on uh, YouTube at all for like an entire week. So uh, this month I'll be better. I'll be a much better grifter this month. John Porton says, we missed you, Uncle. Yeah, thank you, John Porton. Appreciate that. I like the short videos. I like them too. I really like making them. Um, but um, yeah, I got to do both. I got I got to make sure my YouTube content is flowing. I can draw. I can fulfill and do YouTube. I just have to be working all the time. And and uh, like it was baseball. I was watching baseball with Andrea every night. You know, I really enjoyed it. Andrea is into Phillies baseball now. So when the Phillies are on and she's like, Phillies are on and I'm up, I'm up there watching the Phillies. We order a little food, watch baseball together. It's really nice. I enjoyed being a normal person, but it's time to get back into this uh, mentally ill. What is this? Beavis and Butthead single-handedly destroyed Winger. Yeah, I know they did. Uh, Ethan need that money. Andrea tight with them bones. Yeah, I still get paid from the business, but it's not very much. <laughs> like, <laughs> Andrea, can I have a raise? I think all caps comics should give me a raise. I'm doing all the work. <laughs> David L says, we notice fatty. Uh, Leah Dar says, I was put in special ed in grade school until like the last years of high school when they said they should have mainstreamed me like years ago. I was like, no shit. Leah Dar, you're kidding me. That's crazy. Hmm. If you ask, Cecil is a very gifted, funny YouTuber, says Pilgrim Media. You think so? Uh, it just seems dumb to me. He just seems retarded. Uh, by the way, retard. I'm just kidding. Cecil is a genius. What about Narwhal's campaign, says uh, Launch Art? Let me take a look at it. Let's see how uh, uh, the Narwhal campaign is going. Um, and thank you, guys. If you're if you're supporting uh, any... Um, any Indiegogo campaigns? I mean, obviously, that's like uh, the lifeblood of Comicsgate is you guys going, no, I like that one. I'm going to support that one. I'm going to I'm going to give my support to that campaign. You don't have to do all of them, but I mean, you know, make it a you know make it a thing that you're going to back at least one campaign every month. Put aside twenty five dollars and um, support Comicsgate. It just it makes all the difference in the world. You know, twenty new backers, and it looks like. Narwhal is headed towards five thousand dollars. 
yeah you know really appreciate it we're trying to make comics here we're trying to be able to make comics and uh, your support is kind it's the right thing to do it's not the wrong thing to do it's the right thing to do uh, so yeah put aside 25 dollars, whatever you can spare uh, every month and just devote it towards uh, one comic book or as many comic book projects as you can and uh, let's help cg just keep moving there's so many of you who um i i when i'm fulfilling and i'm fulfilling right now you know i just see the same names over and over again like on all the campaigns and i just i like i'm so grateful i it's overwhelming just to be like these people are constantly supporting our business they're keeping us afloat so many of the um same names and then you see new names and you're like i don't know who this person is that's amazing like there are people who are quietly watching the shows they're you know they're just uh i'm comicscape but i'm not you know um, somebody in the chat you know i'm just sort of quietly supporting what you're doing and i just uh you know we appreciate all of this it really is wonderful i love i love what we do based art department says was homeschooled and then mom went to teach special ed oh i'll bet she was really good uh, teaching special ed after like uh, being homeschooled. You you need patience with those kids, those special kids. Uh, play the trailer. Yes, I played it already. I don't know if I'm going to, you want me to play it again? Hotel story. Here we go. Tico, start backing these comments. Synthesize. You must be hamming it up for a big tip. Sin the size. Three simple syllables. They may not mean much to you now, but by the end of this night, they will. There's a witch in this hotel. My mission is to stop her. Could mean certain doom for many if she completes her spell. We're bringing that knowledge back with us to the real world, but we're giving it a special touch. Don't suppose I know you. Adrian. You're a famous party pooper. At your service. Yeah, it just looks great. I mean, you know, uh, Narwhal's an incredible storyteller and really uh, a, a great illustrator uh, who uh, definitely deserves your support. Uh, hotel Story. He just launched it today. Um, and, uh, yeah, like whatever you guys can do to, uh, to make this campaign successful so that he can print it, he can make it a little more special and maybe add some cool, uh, extras. Uh, that would be great. That'd be really great. Uh, as for me, uh, I got a couple of things. If I were you right now, if you haven't backed any toys up to this point, now would be a really good time. Uh, oh, we just got another backer. We're at 1100 backers. Now would be a really good time to support the Electric Blue Cyberfrog variant action figure campaign because we're fulfilling right now. Run, stay in the trees, Heather. Oh, hell yeah. Cyberfrog Electric Blue Action Figure Campaign live right now on Indiegogo for a little while longer. Um, uh, it's not going to be uh, here forever. Uh, we're going to take the campaign down pretty soon, and then we are going to uh, sell, move all the toys over to our eBay store uh, where they will be priced up. It's just a warning. I mean, if you want to get them at $40 a piece, Big Bad Toy Store sold out of most of theirs. Uh, you're only going to be able to get them from us. Unless we send some more to Big Bad Toys. I don't know if we're doing that. I have no idea how that works. I would ask Patrick Thomas Parnell, but I have not seen him recently. Uh, let me see. I ordered all of them signed. Only received one unsigned. What the hell? Uh, don't worry, Agent DeCamp. You're going to get them all. Uh, amazing. 
Uh, let me see. Anna loved them. She nerded out hard, took them out. Uh, looked nice, EVS. You were not cheap about it. Uh, yeah, no, of course not. We spent every penny like making these toys. I, I really wanted them to be as good as they possibly could. Eventually, they'll turn a profit. That's what I keep telling Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like when are you gonna do wave two? I'm like, as soon as I can. Like this was a this was a labor of love, and you know we lost money on it. We haven't made money on it yet. We took all of your money and we sunk our money into it as well uh, to make it work. It was very expensive. I'm still gonna do it. I'm planning on doing a rumble beat, a lily, and a salamandroid toy. Uh, I'm gonna do my best to do those, but I got to give our pocketbook a, a break. I mean, I just have to do that. I can't just keep uh, dipping into our. Uh, our money to make these things happen. Sure, you guys understand. Uh, all right, but so uh, in any case, yeah. Having said that, buy some action figures from us. Help us get closer to profitable um, with this uh, campaign. You know, it's nice. Uh, Cyberfrog three Red Extermination um, is also live, uh, and it has officially passed Cyberfrog one Blood Honey. Uh, which is extraordinary. Thanks, everybody, for that. Uh, Cyberfrog 3 Red Extermination is now the second best-selling Cyberfrog campaign uh, of the series. And we're still moving. I got a lot to do with this campaign, but I'm very busy. I, I want Dark Harvest to be extra special. Uh, I'm you know, still promoting the hell out of Cyberfrog Dark Harvest, and that, uh, that comic book is going to be the next one to come out. Red Extermination still has more covers that need to be revealed. Uh, also, we're going to make it so that the cars, which are limited, by the way, I am limiting the cars. Cars are going to be way more expensive than I thought because we made them very special. We're limiting the cars to 10,000. So the first 10,000 orders are going to receive Cyberfrog uh, Hot Wheels cars. Uh, not Hot Wheels, but Hot Wheels S cars uh, that we're making here. I don't know if I've shown you these. Is this the most updated? No, this is an old pick of it. But uh, in any case, it looks kind of like this. Everybody's going to be receiving one of these for free. At least the first 10,000 backers will. Uh, and uh, that is uh, very exciting. Uh, we're also going to be making a Vespis. And we're talking about making cars that are just sort of, um, it will get like a Porsche and or, or a funny car and then uh, decorated to be Cyber Frog uh, stuff. Uh, well Read Comics says, Ethan can't stop wasting money. I haven't wasted a penny, not a penny, not a penny. This is all you guys are paying for this. It's not me. Uh, Master Racer says Phantom Harlock. Yes, my friend. Yes. Uh, absolutely true. Make a rare Lynx figure. Make about 1,500 of them, says Slim Crow. That just doesn't seem like a good idea. If I made 1,500 of a Lynx figure, they would cost probably $45 a piece to make. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make more or else nobody will agree to make them. Don't worry. We'll we'll get it. When do you think Dark Harvest will be released? Before the end of the year, Kurgan? I want to make sure everybody's got Rec Planet. Uh, and uh, Dark Harvest is a follow-up to Rec Planet. It's actually um, pretty damn good, I must say. Uh, villain and Hero covers coming soon. Yeah, there's, uh, of course, we've announced those, but we haven't shown them yet. Uh, EVS is taking our money like he's the IRS. <laughs> yeah, but I give you something in return. Uh, what does Slimcrow say? Yeah, you can't do... Uh, Slimcrow, you have to do a much bigger... There's something called minimum order quantity. So if you go to a factory to make, say, these Cyberfrog cars, they're going to say, uh, well, how many are you going to make? You go, well, how much is it going to cost to make one of these things? And they're going to say, well, how many are you going to make? And they go, well, how few are you willing to make? Because they're used to working with Hot Wheels and Matchbox, who are going to ask them to make a million of one car. So uh, you have to go, well, how many, what's the lowest number that you're willing to make? And that's your minimum order quantity. Minimum order quantity is usually what we're prepared to do because we just don't have a million people buying Cyberfrog cars. So uh, you say, well, what's the minimum? They'll tell you. Uh, and that's usually what you stick with. So they, they, they agree to make 10,000. Perfect. That's fine. That's fine. That's where we want to be with the uh, cyber frog cars, uh, with the toys, with action figures, which are much more uh, involved. Uh, they will say, uh, "We want, we need you to make ten thousand, eight thousand, 
something like that, somewhere in between there of each toy in order to even consider having your toy at our factory. That's a minimum order quantity for an action figure. Uh, and the more you make, the cheaper they get. But if you were to find a factory that was willing to do something as low as make tooling and everything and paint masters for a toy that you're only making 1500 of, it would be oppressively expensive per toy. They would make it up. They would make up their costs by charging you more per toy. Uh, and that's the whole thing. Uh, 144 is the minimum price point for most apparel producers. That is correct, John. Looks like you've been doing this. Yeah, 144. Uh, 144 I, I do for hats. So usually for the all caps comics hats, I'll double minimum. So I get 288 in. For most things, comic skate hats, I did 144 of, and then most of them are already gone. Um, I think uh, this Who's Smarter pool is wrong. Rini launched a 2.5 campaign and just left for a vacation, so it's not very smart. Uh, it's funny. Randy McRanderson, again, still have not received original Rec Planet books, plus Rec Planet Second Chance Campaign, plus First Wave Action Figure. Get your shipping in order, dude. Yeah, it sounds like it's just you, uh, Random McRanderson. Uh, why don't you... Are you in England or something? Send me what your name is, and we'll expedite your order. I do tell people... We're just going in order. That's all we're doing. We we uh, go, okay, today we're going to do this kind of perk. Uh, we're going to just, you know, print out the labels, the tickets, build the packages in the order that Indiegogo presents it. Uh, and uh, that's what we do. But if you're somebody who goes, hey, my name is uh, John Smith, and I'd really like it if, you know, uh, would you please find my order? We'll, we'll do it for you. We will actually do that. We've done it for many people, and we'll do it for you, too. Uh, it's nice to know that somebody is like anxiously waiting for their product because some people just back and then just kind of forget about it and don't seem to care. <laughs> and we ship it and we never hear. We hear back from about 1% of the packages that we ship out. You know, people really uh, show up on Twitter and they, they show them off or Facebook or YouTube, do reviews. We love feedback. Absolutely love it. Um, yeah, let me see. I gave you, uh, let me see, I gave you my name on Twitter today so you can consolidate to save on shipping. Did Andrew get it? I don't know, Space Monkey. I'm not sure. Uh, all right. <clears throat> I will, I'll find out about that. Remember, it's, uh, it's the all caps comics Twitter. Uh, EVS, did you ever get that $1,000 Stallone? No, I did not. I did not. Did you get it? I have not received it. I did invest a thousand dollars in that Stallone autographed Expendables graphic novel. I don't know where it is. I have gotten all my other Expendables orders though, so I don't know. Evil one says for two dollars, go uh, do something today besides eating donuts and stream. Uh, I'm gonna go draw. I'm working on uh, working on a couple of things around the corner there. What about the mail and cut? Mail and cut is at the printer. It's on its way. Probably be a couple more weeks. We get the melon cut in. It's very exciting. Uh, all right, guys. <laughs> F Zach. No, not F Zach. Uh, all right, everybody. Thank you very much for supporting these campaigns. Thank you for uh, all that you've done. Thank you for making Cyber Frog 3 a big success. Now, having outsold Cyber Frog Blood Honey, let's head towards Rec Planet. Uh, we will get there too. We've got plenty of other things along the way. Uh, and also the Electric Blue uh, campaign. Uh, back it, get your action figures, and uh, thanks very much. Back, Hotel Story uh, by Per Berg, a.k.a. Narwhal, 5,000. Let's go. Oh, so close. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm going to go. I'm going to get back to work. Appreciate your hanging out with me today. Uh, super Chats. Are there more Super Chats? Drama can be fun. Other times, it's mind-numbing. Uh, finally caught a stream live, says Steve Turney. Uh... Let me see. Um, I guess I saw that. I read that. Ordered hats. I read that. Uh, oh, no problem. Just curious. I do want my honeycomb box. Yes. Uh, uh, dumb old Vic says, Eric sounds like a weenie Y guy. Uh, they all do. Uh, okay. It was homeschool. Women love special needs men. Faye Malin. 
And uh, I, I'm Marduk Knight. I read all your super chats. Class of CG 2017, back dies of March and all supplementals. That's the thing. I'm in the UK. Any chance of expedited shipping? Uh, yeah, of course. Pa especially you, Peppermint Oil Capsule. Just uh, send us a note. We'll take care of you uh, tomorrow, Monday. Get the boys to put that together for you. For the rest of you, thank you so much. And uh, we will uh, see you again tomorrow. Uh, how did you know my name was John Smith? Psychic. Uh, tell Shane to start a stream. Shane, start a stream. Oh, Frag is live. Go see Frag. Guys, have a great day. And uh, I will see you again tomorrow with another video. Um, what am I closing out with? I forgot how to even do live streams uh, since this was mentioned earlier. Take care, everyone. <laughs> hey, Donnie Cates. Ethan, how you doing, pal? Good. I'm live right now. Like, people can hear you, so I'm warning you of that right now. Like, I'm actually doing a live stream right now. You want to say hi to Comicsgate? Um, well, I would prefer if you and I could have a private conversation. I really would. Well, you, I can't because I'm having a very public conversation. But if you want to say hi, Comicsgate, they could hear you right now, and they'd be very happy. 2,000 people. Um, um, um. I, I understand that, but I, but, hey, 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 I understand that, I get it, I get it, we're all good, everything is good here, I'm just saying that a, a, a text, I will, I will, I will, hey, 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 look, I'll just say this, and you know what, and I'll just say this, all right, all right, and, 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 and what, what I, but I will say, uh, 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 publicly here, I, 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 but, 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 Right. I, 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 I'm serious when I, well, when I say that. I can see where you're coming from, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, um, 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 uh, any, uh, again, um, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. That's the conversation, right? I, I, and look, you're not going to get this from fucking Scott Snyder. You're not going to get this from anybody else. Like, I'm, I'm actually trying to fucking... Like reach out to you, right? And if I'm not being as eloquent as I as I want to be right now, um, I like to leave you with this, guys. And 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 of 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 to the to the to the to the. To the but I will say this, man. I I I will never do anything to try and take food off of anyone's tables. Um, um, but, um, all right, pal. All right, you have a good one. See you later. Woo!